That is why my soul is shining. Feel this like I'm 10 years old. New and exciting. Hey. You don't have to dig too deep to find out your effect on me. Everyone that I know in my life is asking me, is it going to be your one? Man, you touch his gold. Everything you touch is 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 gold. Meeting you here. Touching your hand, seeing you in the morning. La 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 la. If I went there, I could write a thousand songs about you. If I went there, I could write a thousand songs about you. Baby, time is a weird chemistry time and a weird chemistry time. Right there, and then right there. Don't you go nowhere. Thank you. 
Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the first session of the day. So to start, we have a quick announcement and then we will start the session. Welcome. All right, good morning everyone. This is just a PSA uh, to remind you uh, that COVID is still with us, um, as we've noticed already at the meeting. Um, so please, if you are not feeling well, do not come to the sessions of the conference. Um, if you need assistance for uh, testing um, or travel, or if you need uh, someone to get food to your room, if you're not feeling well, please let us know and we can help coordinate all those things. If you need a mask, we do have them at the registration desk um, and several other folks wandering around also have extra masks with them. Thank you. Thank you. So this is, uh, I will introduce the first talk. This is session six. And the first talk will be from Adam Kepesh on, uh, from Uni Washington University. Hello, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, first, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's, uh, it's my favorite conference. So um, I'm going to tell you about the neural architecture of confidence. Um, and this is sort of a, a work uh, that's been long running uh, in my lab. So I'm going to start with uh, some historical ideas and then, and then sort of tell you about um, the latest. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, first welcome to the final round of Jeopardy. Uh, we're in for an exciting competition. The topic is machine learning. Um, uh, <clears throat> and as you know, in the final round, each player can bet uh, a different amount. It, it, it sounds very loud to me here. OK. Um, so each player can bet a different amount, and the appropriate wager can really make the difference uh, between winning and losing. So, so you can see the question a deep learning architecture introduced uh, in 2017 that revolutionized the field of natural language processing by capturing long-term dependencies. Um, and look at our first contestant, her face is expressing some doubt, uh, maybe lack of confidence. Uh, 
She's challenged. Uh, some of you might know the answer. Uh, she does too. What is a transformer? All right. Our next contestant uh, is a rat. This little critter has done well so far. You can see the score uh, and also knew the correct answer. But does he have a sense of <clears throat> confidence to make the appropriate wager? Now, our final contestant, surprise, surprise, is ChatGPT, the AI. Sophisticated machine can hold conversations with humans and did really well. But does it know its confidence level? Well, all three contestants answered correctly, but who will win? Now, it all depends on their wagers. Uh, ChatGPT wagered zero. Um, now, the humans wins ultimately, but maybe her wager was a bit overconfident and she just got lucky. Uh, certainly, ChatGPT had no clue. In fact, when I asked ChatGPT about it, it assured me that it does not do wagers. So the zero is actually the correct answer if you probe it. Um, so I wanted to show you sort of this complex interplay between subjective confidence and objective measures of confidence, confidence in humans and animals. But uh, knowing your confidence is really not a party trick. It can be a matter of life or death. So let me illustrate this with a video uh, of a white Tesla coming uh, on autopilot. And you can see uh, on the side there is a person. Uh, it goes undetected. And there's a truck overturned, and it crashes into it. Uh, so the autopilot is not perfect. Uh, but that's not my point. The, the, this is a very simple visual situation. Uh, look at what human drivers do uh, when they encounter this situation that they probably never encountered in their life before. Well, first they slow down, sort of gather more information, and avoid it. Uh, and presumably, again, neither the Tesla nor the driver has ever seen the situation. So the question is how they deal with it. And I think this is a systemic problem um, with large AI systems. So just for fun, let's see uh, what a rat would do in the same situation. So we did not set up a, a hush. Uh, this is a maze. Um, so the rat knows this route really, really well. But you're going to see this yellow marking that's um, a wall that we take out just for the first time. So the animal is really going really fast, and it notices the novelty, looks around, makes a decision, and speeds up. Uh, and I believe this really captures the essence of how animals, including us, uh, deal with the unknown compared to AI. So today I will discuss a, a specific aspect uh, of meta-knowledge confidence, uh, and I'm going to present you uh, with an approach that starts with statistics and human psychophysics, and going to relate this to uh, the subjective, to, to use, to relate the subjective and objective notions of confidence to each other. And then I'll talk about how we study this in rats uh, before moving on to neural circuits uh, and review of some of our older work uh, before getting into the circuit data. And at the end, I'll, I'll mention some implications for, for AI. So we consider confidence uh, as an ability that confers fitness advantage. And as humans, we experience it as a feeling. Um, but perhaps um, it's more than that. For all kinds of decision makers, in the face of uncertainty, you really ought to use confidence if you want to make the right financial investment. Um, you need to know how much confidence you have uh, in, in deciding to put your life savings in particular stock. And a rat uh, might similarly need to know its confidence uh, when finding a food and sort of figuring out whether to stick around. So in fact, for all investments, whether those be of time, uh, effort, money, uh, they should optimally reflect confidence. But the question is, how do we sort of operationalize this? And, and intuitively, uh, we should sort of go with a common definition. In statistics, it is the posterior probability that a hypothesis is correct given the internal evidence. And this is the, the challenge here. So historically, it's been difficult to use this definition for a couple of reasons. Uh, so I can write this down. Uh, you have some sort of perceptual input. Um, hold on. Point to a laser pointer here. Um, that's corrupted by some noise, and it leads to a decision process. And you write down uh, the, the, the confidence, which is the probability that the hypothesis you chose is correct, given this internal evidence, right? And that's really hard because you can't directly access this. Uh, this makes it subjective. And so we've developed uh, a statistical and behavioral framework uh, to get around this. Um, 
And I'm just going to show you three key properties, uh, we call signatures, um, and these are visualizations of theorems that are, uh, that are underlying this um, in tasks where you have perceptual or any sort of uncertainty and, and a single correct answer. So first, confidence should predict accuracy. So the trial-by-trial -trial, uh, variations in an appropriate notion of confidence predicts the average case scenario. Second, uh, using a psychophysics approach, uh, we can vary discriminability from very difficult uh, to very easy. And for correct choices, the average confidence goes up. And for error choices, average confidence goes down. So I'm going to get into this in a little bit. But this is uh, one of the key predictions. And furthermore, uh, let's call this insight. If you plot the psychometric function and separate the accuracy uh, based on confidence, for the very same stimulus, uh, higher confidence will lead to higher accuracy. So we can also parameterize these uh, models um, with certain, uh, if you assume certain noise models, and then make quantitative predictions. Okay, so let me first visually illustrate uh, perhaps the most puzzling prediction using a signal detection theory framework, just to sort of give you some insight here. So we have a very simple uh, discrimination task here. Okay, here. The stimulus may be uh, purple or blue, and the experimenter provides you with a patch. Uh, and this patch of color may be noisy, so the perception could be sort of on either side of it. And on a given trial, you experience this value in one particular spot, and there's a decision, that's a very simple comparison, whether this dot is to the left or the right of the boundary. And confidence actually can be also very simply estimated here with the distance to the boundary. Uh, and now, if you sort of run this again, uh, you can see there could be correct and error decisions, depending on whether you're the left or the right of the boundary in that particular trial. And again, the distances uh, can provide this proxy for confidence. So now, if you're going to plot confidence uh, against the difficulty level right here, you can see that error confidence is higher than correct confidence. And this makes sense, because the, the maximum possible distances here uh, are shorter. Now, if you have an easier stimulus, the patch is right here, you start out further from the boundary. So by the same logic, uh, the, you have much fewer uh, error trials. And these error trials are going to be always closer to the boundary, so confidence will be lower. Uh, and confidence for correct trials will be higher because the maximum possible distance is, is larger than the previous case. So this just sort of gives you an intuition or these kind of patterns uh, that I'm going to show you. But again, uh, these follow actually from certain uh, statistical frameworks. Now, many years ago, the first question we asked uh, was actually, how does this mathematical framework actually correspond to the sort of subjective notion of confidence? Uh, and the basic idea that we uh, implemented is a very simple per perceptual discrimination task. It's a clicks task. So uh, the person uh, listens to random clicks uh, from the left and the right uh, speakers. Uh, and the balance determines uh, whether the correct answer is left or right. You can see it here. Uh, so we change the balance of clicks trial to trial. And then we simply ask them to answer on a scale of 1 to 5 how confident they felt. And this is sort of the overall distribution. But we were not really interested in the overall distribution, whether they answered a 5 or a 4 or whatnot, but whether their answer was sort of statistically right. And what we could do here uh, is kind of parameterize this, this uh, model that I, that I told you. So we can use uh, a, 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 an assumption of Gaussian noise uh, and infer the decision noise from the psychometric function, from directly from the performance. Uh, this performance is achievable. Uh, with a certain sigma, then we can compute sort of the expected statistical confidence, and then calibrate it back to the way the person used uh, their self-reports. Uh, and this is really important uh, because we don't want to make any assumptions. So this is the predicted confidence in sort of plotted in two different ways, uh, the subjective predicting the objective, and this kind of a biometric way, the average confidence as a function of the difficulty. So these are predicted, again, without any free parameters, so we just estimated it based on the data. We didn't adjust anything. And this is the data for a person. And this is fairly typical. So 
And statistical confidence will get you very close to the actual reports uh, that people make. Um, and importantly, this kind of approach is, is agnostic to the reporting scale uh, and certain kinds of biases. Now, how do we do this in a rat? Um, well, we can't ask them uh, about their confidence, but we can ask them to make different time investments. So you have the same exact task in this case, uh, the clicks task, uh, going from uh, left to right balance. Uh, the animal uh, answers almost always correctly for these trials. Uh, and for the other, other side, it again performs almost always correctly. So then we can change it to trial to trial. And we trick the animal because we don't immediately deliver the reward. Oh, I can't animate it anymore to change the arrow back. OK. So we introduce a, a varying uh, time reward. So the animal doesn't immediately get rewarded, but according to some schedule. And for error trials, we don't give feedback. So at some point, the animal realizes that there's not going to be a reward, and they leave. And we measure this as a time investment. Now, for correct trials, most of the time they get rewarded, and we have about 10% probe trials where they were correct, uh, but we trick them, don't give them reward, and we can measure how long they, they invested in that trial. So this is their time investment distribution. Uh, and again, we can play the same trick. Oops. Oops. Oh, I wanted to show you the video. But I need to change again. The... It's not working. Okay, here. You drag the mouse to the other screen. Okay. I think there's something wrong before my presentation crashed. So let's, let, let this not, 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 let's not make it crash. Okay. Um, so we can do the same trick. Um, so I didn't show you the video what the animal is actually doing. But we can do the same trick that I just mentioned to you, that you have a psychometric function. We infer uh, the noise level. Uh, that we transform it back uh, to the right confidence report. And so let me show you in detail. So you have this psychometric function, and with this Gaussian noise model, uh, we can essentially generate uh, the expected confidence levels for this level of performance. And then transform the confidence back into time investment. That's one of the other key pieces. Because we don't know what the right time investment is, whether it's four or five seconds. That doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is the ordering. Um, and by doing so, uh, we can generate all these three predictions quantitatively. Uh, the, the solid lines are the predictions. Again, these are bits uh, uh, to the data. There's no adjustment made. Uh, and these are uh, the data points uh, reflect the actual animal's performance. So, so you can see that we can get very close to the right answer. So this makes us very happy because it shows that our framework actually captures uh, a certain kind of confidence in humans and also uh, applicable to animals. Now, we've done this uh, in many different modalities. Uh, we've done it in humans in vision, uh, for general knowledge, for memory confidence, and in rats uh, for olfaction, and also for memory confidence, and mice in, in an auditory detection task. Uh, and we always find the same uh, answer. In fact, actually, we've done it the time investment also in humans. So the core claim here is that confidence is really an internal sense that originates in a statistical confidence computation. Often people focus on the kind of confidence illusions, biases, miscalibration. Those happen all the time for, cer for, cer uh, for sure. However, uh, it's important to consider whether this sense is adaptive in some ways. And if it's adaptive, it needs to start from some uh, appropriate quantity. And I think this should be statistical confidence. Uh, and what our data point to is that this origination of this uh, confidence estimate is uh, in the statistical computation. But of course, it can be modified later. So instead of going sort of that direction of sort of seeing how confidence in humans uh, gets kind of changed, I want to focus on where it is in the brain. And I'm going to sort of tell you a story about um, a dedicated brain circuit uh, and a framework uh, for studying this. 
So first, um, how do we even find confidence, right? Sort of, it's a little unclear. So in vision, you know where to look, right? You look in visual cortex, you know what to change. You change some parameter in the world. And um, for these external senses, you can sort of uh, focus on the computation. You can do that uh, for, for motor cortex as well. Um, and again, maybe the, the actual computation is a little bit more complicated than a tuning curve, uh, but this mapping of the external to neural activity really works. And you can even go to deep areas like the hippocampus, um, and this approach sort of enabled the field to identify what is represented there uh, primarily as location, uh, and so on. So in confidence, right, it's kind of hard. So first, you don't know where confidence cortex is. Second, uh, how do we vary confidence directly, right? So you, you kind of want a, a way to, to manipulate it, but it's, it's, as I just argued before, it's an internal sense. So on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, we only know the average. We don't really know uh, uh, what's happening. So what I'd like to argue is that the approach that I showed you um, can be viewed as a computation, it's sort of a little bit equivalent to tuning curves or sort of the computational decoding frameworks, and we can use that to study confidence, whereas we can use uh, the behavioral readout uh, to see if this actually drives behavior. And often in cognitive uh, tasks, people focus on the right side, on the behavioral correlation, because it's so difficult to access the left side of the computation. OK. So we're going to focus on this part of the brain, uh, the lateral, ventral lateral portion of OFC that we believe uh, contains sort of key circuitry for competence computations. And here I'm showing you the firing of a, of a single neuron plotted the same way as I did for behavior and the model predictions. But now we have firing rate on the axes. And what you can see, this, this single neuron uh, predicts in the, during the waiting time, I didn't tell you this is during the waiting time, predicts the accuracy of the whole animal. It's kind of incredible that you could just read this out. Um, and in fact, it tracks sort of every aspect of our statistical confidence model. And this is something that uh, I started actually as a postdoc with Zach Maiden and Naoshiga Uchida uh, a long time ago. And, and that sort of set us on track, but we didn't know a number of other features about what confidence would look like. So first we needed to know that it actually predicts the confidence-guided behavior, and it does. Um, we find that a large fraction of these neurons also predict trial by trial um, during the time investment uh, how long the animal will invest. We can also turn off this brain region, selectively impair confidence-guided time investments without changing other aspects of the behavior, the overall time duration that they invest or, uh, or the performance. It's really just the way in which time investment depends on uh, this confidence. OK, so these were statistical predictions. Uh, but then in a series of studies, we kind of figured out a few more things that are not actually predicted by statistics. Right? So first, um, if confidence is a metacognitive quantity, you might want it to, to be irrespective of sensory modality, kind of generalized. Uh, and in fact, uh, this was done by, by Paul Massey and, and uh, Torben Ott in the lab. And you can see, again, just a single neuron uh, to show you how strong this result is. We never found a discordant neuron. So these, the single neuron uh, fires the same way for olfactory versus auditory trials. Uh, and essentially, all of our neurons do the same. So now, another aspect that you might worry about is whether we really focused on a particular task. So this might have to do something with time investment. So it's really about the motor aspect uh, and not sort of the, the confidence aspect. So you kind of want to predict multiple behaviors. Um, and it turns out that in this task, there's kind of a confidence-guided learning behavior embedded in there. Uh, and we also could show that a fraction of the neurons, the negatively tuned neurons, not all of them, uh, but just the negatively tuned confidence neurons, actually predicted uh, the, this updating behavior that depends on confidence sort of multiple seconds in advance. So, so the same neurons also generalize across different uses of confidence. Now, another thing you might worry about is that there's different kinds of variables here. Uh, maybe because OFC has central role in value-guided uh, behaviors, it's sort of an aspect of value. And if you introduce reward manipulations, it turns out that there are some neurons that care about confidence and reward uh, and, and encode sort of an integrated value, but there's neurons that actually don't care about reward size and only care about um, 
the, uh, the confidence. And then finally, um, th there's sort of a big question here, where in frontal cortex, things are really messy. Uh, is this really a distinct uh, quantity uh, or entity even from other variables, or is it just something that I'm reading out? So I want to show you where we stood sort of a long time ago when we started uh, and first reported these neurons. And actually, it really bothered me. You can see uh, this is a distribution of, selectivity, of some selectivity index that captures confidence neurons. So the red ones are the negatively uh, tuned confidence ones. These are the positively tuned confidence neurons. And the middle ones are not significant. And you can see that the, the example neurons are really nice. Sort of they have the, the key features in other ways as well. But it kind of looks like kind of edges of distributions. This always bothered me. Um, and I think this is, uh, but it's something that perhaps we can fix. And this is what happened when Junya Hirokawa came to the lab, and he focused on improving the behavioral task. So one way to think about this problem is that here we have really just eight dimensions to probe the neural activity in. On the other hand, uh, we can do a little bit better. So if we do uh, a reward-biased uh, version of the task, we can also manipulate reward value, and we can also look for an updating a learning phenomenon that's related to reinforcement learning. These three uh, ideas, sort of confidence, reward value, and reinforcement learning, have been all implicated mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in OFC function. Now, in terms of task uh, variables, we get 42 dimensions. And this has been key so that now if we uh, try to actually cluster our neurons, uh, as you can see, uh, this is the adjacency matrix, they're very nicely clustered. And just to show you one example, one of the clusters, uh, is actually these confidence neurons, the actual confidence neurons. Now I'm plotting it, not correct error, but left and right choice. Um, and these are the ones that actually do not vary with reward size, if you manipulate that. And there's one group that varies with reward size. So, so this kind of reveals that if you probe it the right way, um, the system uh, actually uh, encodes uh, distinct decision variables. OK, so let's, let's speed up a little bit. Uh, this is where we are. How do we actually uh, try to understand the algorithm for time investment? Uh, sorry. So the, the goal here is to map the decision confidence into time investment duration. So um, if you start out with a high confidence, we have this uncertainty accumulator at a low level. And then as time passes, uh, you add to this uncertainty accumulator based on how uncertain you are about the reward. So the reward expectancy adds to it, and you add to it all the way until a threshold is reached, and then you leave. Now, if you start out at a low level of confidence, then your uncertainty is high. Uh, but as time passes, the same sort of thing happens, and you leave earlier. And this invokes three kinds of computations about the initial decision confidence, the temporal reward expectancy, and the confidence thresholds. And these are sort of three uh, variables that we can think about computationally. So I argued until now about statistical confidence, but you can also study uh, if you vary the reward hazard rate and the opportunity cost uh, as variables. And these three things will implement uh, this normative uh, model. OK. But we don't just want to sort of fit this model to the data. We actually want to try to see what the cortex is doing. And, and so we, what, what we wanted to do is actually infer the cortical algorithm directly from spikes. Um, and this was done uh, by, by three incredible people in the lab, Amy Christensen, who's actually going to give the last talk, so she's going to go into detail. She's really uh, a, an amazing postdoc, who's, you'll see what she's done. Um, and this was started by Torben Ott, who runs his lab uh, at Bernstein now, and Paul Massé, who's a postdoc at Harvard. So what we did is sort of record a lot of neurons. We already had a lot of neurons. And then you worry that like, they all look different. Turns out, if you cluster them now in terms of temporal dynamics, they also cluster, not just in terms of the tuning, but also in terms of sort of when they fire. And I'm going to focus on four different clusters for you. These four different clusters have very, very intriguing dynamics. So first of all, if I plot you the sort of average cluster dynamic, these are always the core recorded neurons. Um, you can see that this is very, very robust. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of the time investment, and this is the end of the time investment when they leave. And let me show you sort of the details of two of these clusters, 7 and 11. If you align to uh, the beginning of time investment, you can see that this cluster sort of ramps up differentially, predicting different time durations. And you can see sort of it peaks right before 
you can see it really nicely. It's really important that it peaks right before, so it actually has the potential to causally drive the decision uh, to leave. And then this pink cluster is also intriguing because it ramps up very fast right before the decision. It almost feels like it resets the dynamics. So we're seeing a local reset. This is kind of sets up our framework for understanding these dynamics. These are, and again, these are, we can see this across rats uh, and data sets. Um, but again, we didn't just want to sort of take these exemplars, but rather use this observation of clustering to reduce the problem. So if we actually want to infer the dynamic algorithm, we can sort of use uh, recurrent uh, uh, dynamics to model this. And what Amy did is, is, uh, is train the variational recurrent autoencoder. But instead of dealing with all the neurons, she could basically focus on the neurons that were active during the time investment period, these four groups of neurons, uh, and in fact, replace neural activity with cluster activity. So she really only has uh, four uh, latent units, uh, grooves uh, that, that she's trained up. She feeds them the starting activity, and then she learns the predicted activity through the whole time investment, many, many seconds away. And what you can, show, you can see, uh, this network runs really, really well uh, the, the time investment. And actually, even though we trained it on the, the activity, you can use it to read out the behavior really well, the, how long the, the rat is investing. And in fact, it's twice as good as the best linear decoder. So this is not a trivial uh, result. Now, I don't want to tell you all of, uh, and I don't want to steal her all of her thunder here, but what's really exciting for us, because in a way, by reducing uh, the problem uh, with clustering, we can sort of discover this decision-making algorithm that's just 12 equations. It predicts both the neural activity and the behavior. It explains about a third uh, of our OFC neurons, those that are engaged uh, during the time investment decisions. And perhaps more intriguingly, uh, the model actually arrives at the normative solution to the time investment problem, but kind of does so not in the obvious way that we imagine. Okay, so, so this is what we know about the, the algorithm. Uh, but what about cell types? So sort of what's underneath all these uh, firing patterns is, is we know there's different types of, of neurons based on connectivity uh, and, and uh, gene expression and different interneuron types. So we had a very clear hypothesis about cluster 11 because you can see this is the, the cluster that sort of starts firing a little bit before the leaving. Uh, and it looks like it's resetting things. So we thought it might be the, the PV neurons. And Torben uh, took PV Cree rats uh, and used uh, optogenic uh, cell type identification uh, to record a bunch of uh, PV positive uh, interneurons. These are inhibitor neurons that target the soma. And here's one example. You can see for different time durations, uh, this PV neuron sort of fires at the moment of reset, and about, I think, about 40% of uh, the neurons that he recorded uh, do the same. So this shows that at least uh, this type of neuron uh, captures some of the, the, the computational uh, feature uh, in terms of biology. Now, one thing you might worry about uh, is, okay, but really what we're talking about is sort of a low rank structure of the connectivity matrix uh, that, that must give rise to all these uh, different patterns. So we really wanted to understand uh, the circuitry underneath uh, so Sulin in the lab uh, decided to fully map out uh, the subcortical projections of neuron types of rat OFC uh, uh, along with Torben. And let me just summarize a ton of uh, experiments and data in three points. So first, she showed uh, one neuron, one main subcortical uh, target connectivity pattern uh, using MapSeq uh, by Tony Zader here. Uh, then she showed that these target-defined subcortical projections actually represent molecularly distinct subtypes, which is kind of interesting because uh, these are generally grouped together as extra telencephalic neurons. And finally, these different cortical neurons actually are located in different sublayers of layer 5b. Um, so basically, this has really strong implications for both local connectivity, and it gives us a lot of ideas for, for what to target. OK, so one clear piece uh, of evidence that we have uh, for uh, the role of projection-based uh, uh, function 
is neurons uh, from OFC that project to the striatum. So Junya Hirokawa in the lab uh, recorded, again, optogenic cell type identification, uh, these neurons that project from the lateral uh, OFC to the striatum. And what you can see here is about three quarters of the neurons show this pattern where for error trials, the neurons ramped up in firing. But most interestingly, this was sustained many, many seconds into the future until the next trial. So there's this kind of sustained uh, representation of, of negative outcomes um, in OFC. And this is the kind of thing that might be useful for uh, temporal credit assignment. Now, we see the same exact cluster, or well, we think it's the same exact cluster, in our time investment task, which is kind of a different uh, task variant. And here, I'm showing you cluster four that uh, does the same, that after the outcome, uh, the neurons ramp up in firing when there is no reward. And this is sustained all the way to the next trial. Oh, this is the cluster that we can find without cell type identification in the original task. Uh, so finally, uh, this is really exciting for us, uh, Christine Constantinople uh, looked back uh, at their data in RAT OFC with Carlos Brody in a risky decision task and identified sort of a very different, a very similar uh, functional group of neurons. And, and really, I couldn't be more excited about this because it really shows that despite the complexity of frontal cortex, we're now in a position uh, to reproduce each other's results and, and, and build on it. Um, so, so I think this is, is really uh, was, was just tremendous excitement for me. And it shows that in three different tasks and even across different labs, uh, we are seeing some of the same features. All right, so, so finally, uh, we've set out to actually figure out what the time investment neurons are actually doing and who they are. Um, but we can't just go neuron type by neuron type. We really wanted to find a way to target directly to these time investment neurons. I call them the time investment neurons, the ones that ramp up. Again, they ramp up for many, many seconds and peak right before leaving. So we started a collaboration uh, with Thomas Klausberger in Vienna and set up the sort of the same uh, behavioral setups. Uh, and what they can do is, is absolutely incredible. They can put glass electrodes uh, in freely behaving uh, rats uh, and juxtacellular record activity. And so once you juxtacellular record activity, uh, you can then, then find the ramping neurons based on function and then inject dye and later post hoc um, uh, recover these uh, neurons and reconstruct the morphology and axon. Uh, I mean, this is an incredibly difficult uh, technique, so we don't have very many neurons, you can see one that was recorded, um, you can see sort of very high quality uh, recordings at the end, right before the animal leaves, uh, uh, you see this burst of activation. And this is the reconstructed neuron. I don't know if you can make it out. This is uh, uh, the whole brain, and this is the single neuron in it. And not only do you see these sort of interesting fi firing patterns, but this is a very interesting portion of OFC. This is kind of the polar uh, region, the very front of OFC. Um, and this is where the apical dendrites actually turn up. So the apical dendrites point towards the, the eye. So this is the frontal pole of, of, uh, of OFC in a way. <clears throat> and all of these neurons project subcortically, at least for some of them we know they project to the brainstem. So, so this is where we are in terms of um, uh, understanding the circuitry and sort of we have many, many uh, exciting uh, projects that are trying in different ways to bring this together. So let me, let me kind of summarize um, our results and, and what I was trying to tell you. So first we started with this somewhat uh, nebulous notion of confidence. And first I wanted to convince you that we have a nice behavioral and statistical framework uh, to study this. And the conclusion is that confidence is an internal sense uh, that is able to kind of summarize uh, uh, propositions, hypotheses, actions, outcomes, and, and determine the confidence about it. Now, then I tell you a bunch of stories uh, about the dynamics of orbital frontal cortex and the circuitry underlying it. And, and I'd like to argue that orbital frontal cortex contains a dedicated circuitry dealing with confidence. But of course, confidence is going to be relevant for a lot of different brain regions. So I don't want to, uh, I didn't show you data, for instance, about dopamine and so on. So what does it all kind of mean? Let me end on a somewhat more speculative note, uh, what we could learn from the brain and try to apply it to AI. So until recently, as you could see, um, we've been focused on sort of taking the mystery out of confidence and using statistics to study it. 
But it turns out that there is sort of a number of features of neural representations um, that we just couldn't predict from first principles alone. And I think we really need to understand the circuit architecture better, uh, in part because it's kind of unclear how all the relevant information could be routed to FC uh, for one place in monitoring. So in a way, um, I call this the metacognitive bottleneck hypothesis, that there's, how does the decentralized way to monitor internal processes is powerful, but it introduces probably some trade-offs. Uh, and we're really interested in studying this also in the context of AI. So currently, uh, we're trying to be creating these virtual um, environments. One worked in the lab uh, is doing this uh, so we can have the, the, the AI algorithms face the same exact challenges as our rats. So we have this platform for doing comparative behavioral studies uh, and trying to understand whether some existing machine learning architectures might already have the features necessary for what we call metacognition or what would be the kind of the minimal ways to augment things. So this is my last slide. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and, and acknowledge all the incredible people in the lab who's done this work. Uh, and stay for the end because Amy is going to tell you uh, in detail about this incredible uh, approach to uncover the algorithm directly from spikes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes? Hi, Adam. Nicely done. I was wondering, with all the talk about attention and oscillations, have you seen any change? Can you speak yeah, closer to the microphone? Oh, sorry. I was wondering, with you know, all the knowledge we have about oscillations and attention, have you looked at any changes in gamma dynamics or something like that? No, unfortunately, we have not really looked. Uh, a long time ago, I looked. Uh, it, it was sort of inconsistent in OFC, I think, partially because of the, the location uh, in terms of it's hard to target the same sort of layers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very interesting talk. And you mentioned uh, towards the end that uh, the Constantinople lab had done something with risky decision making. I was wondering if in your lab you had looked at either the neural activity or the behavior um, in a case where the objective probability varies similarly to how the confidence level would vary, right? Like, uh, if, if you could mirror the degree of confidence and the statistical probability that we assume is assigned to it in each case in the objective probability of reward delivery and what that would look like. Okay, so... By varying the perceptual uncertainty, we're doing the same, right? So, so a given difficulty level implies uh, that they're going to get a different. So we can do that sort of in an economic setting. So we've done matching tasks, is that what you're asking? We can do a probability matching task and also use uh, a time investment as a readout. Yes. And I was curious what that looks like compared to confidence in terms of the if you look at what, what we assume the animal is picking up in terms of probability of reward versus its subjective estimates of confidence, how that compared. I see. So we, have, we haven't recorded an OFC, uh, but we've done a lot of dopamine recordings uh, in that case. It's, it's actually fairly complicated because in any of these tasks, it's really difficult to know what the actual strategy, behavioral strategy is. So it's a really, really interesting question. It's, we know roughly what the reinforcement learning strategy is to do these matching tasks, but we actually want to account for it on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. Uh, it's, it gets a bit murkier, so that's... Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I want to ask a bit of a beer question, uh, something a bit philosophical. So looking at this type of analysis, uh, so two questions. First, if you compare the orbit of frontal cortex to other places, does a similar clustering uh, approach work in other cortical areas? And if this is the case, uh, and this is the philosophical part, do you think we are actually approaching uh, a more thorough understanding in, of Mars free levels through this type of work? It's a very loaded question in so many different ways, um, but thank you. Um, I think um, in frontal cortex, we've been in this very difficult situation where everywhere else in the brain, you could record sort of individual neurons and kind of make sense of them. Even though you knew the individual neurons weren't doing the business, right? You still need to record populations of hippocampal cells to understand things or visual cortical cells. But you kind of knew how to probe the individual cells. 
And I think uh, what we've been missing in frontal cortex is this ability to probe the individual cell. It doesn't mean it's not the populations that are doing it. Uh, and I think part of the answer has to do with the task. I think in OFC, we've been sort of privileged because we actually kind of know the classes of tasks that are driving this area. Um, and I think that really helped us design the right tasks. I think we also uh, need to have better methods for discovering these clusters. Uh, I think sometimes, again, there's experimental limitations, and I think once we have better methods, I think we're going to see more clustering. I don't have direct evidence for that in other areas yet, but yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. One last question. So in real life, <clears throat> sampling is, is hard, and we have to make a decision uh, soon. So I guess we have to learn over time uh, what confidence is. You mentioned already that reinforcement learning, of course, there's a component there which can change it. I'm just wondering if you have looked at like the time change and how uh, quickly I could change confidence levels, and uh, is there any mechanism related to that? So the, the relevant aspect to this is sort of the reporting business. So because we use time investment as a reporting um, modality, uh, they need to know when rewards are coming. So that's learned over sort of sessions. Um, but we can manipulate the actual time investment trial by trial. So I think the confidence readout is really trial by trial. Um, it's only sort of the, the utility function for the right amount of time that's reinforcement learning. Uh, Great. Okay. Thank you. Let's thanks again. Our thank you very speaker. much. And let me introduce the, our next speaker, who is Diksha Gupta, and who will talk about understanding everything, everywhere. That's a great title. <laughs> Great. Hi, everyone. Today, I will tell you about a distributed implementation of evidence accumulation in corticostriatal circuitry. So in our daily lives, we constantly have to make decisions based on noisy streams of evidence. One example of this that you might have experienced quite a bit, maybe last cosine, is trying to decide whether or not it is safe to attend an in-person conference. Since you are a cosine attendee, you likely made this decision optimally. So by accumulating evidence from the many factors that bear on this decision in order to reduce uncertainty and committing to one decision or the other when the accumulated evidence met your personal threshold. In our lab, we study the neural underpinnings of such computations that are fundamental to making decisions by training rats to perform a task that requires accumulation of evidence. In this task, animals receive two streams of randomly timed clicks on their left and right and they have to choose the side that played the greater number of clicks to get a water reward. So to perform well in this task, animals need to accumulate leftward and rightward evidence throughout the trial in order, um, throughout the trial. And they perform this task quite well, as you can see from these psychometric curves. And this task allows us to estimate animals' internal accumulated trajectory quite precisely on single trials, thanks to the randomly timed and discrete nature of the stimulus. So this gives us a really nice paradigm to study the neural basis of decision making. So how do we go about doing that? The decision making process is often conceptualized as a series of feed forward computations in which incoming momentary evidence must first be accumulated and then at a later time point thresholded to make a choice. An influential idea that has driven most of the work in animals is that such feed-forward computations can be mapped onto feed-forward chains of brain regions. And this idea has been very successful in unraveling the primate visual hierarchy and has been extended to evidence accumulation. So what follows from this view is that a brain region's position in this chain determines when its perturbations would have an effect. So if a region is involved in accumulation, then its perturbation should have an effect throughout the stimulus, so in both the first and second halves of the accumulation period. And indeed, previous work in our lab found that the interior dorsal part of striatum, or ADS, shows exactly this effect. So unilateral inactivations of ADS bias the animal's decision in both first and second halves of the stimulus, and the average tuning of neurons in this region encode the value of accumulated evidence. 
On the other hand, if a region is involved in thresholding, then its imp uh, per um, perturbations would only impair decisions at the very end of the accumulation and not during the first half. And remarkably, previous work in a lab found that the frontal orienting fields, or FOF, a part of rat's secondary motor cortex, shows this effect. So its silencing only produces an effect in the uh, second half or the very end of the accumulation period, and the average tuning of neurons in this region reflects the thresholded accumulator value. So what emerges from these studies is a promising hypothesis of a feed-forward functional hierarchy going from ADS, which does the accumulation, to FOF, which thresholds the output of this accumulator. In the brain, this maps onto a multisynaptic pathway in which signals from ADS must be relayed with the basal ganglia and midbrain before they reach FOF. This is despite the fact that FOF is actually a major monosynaptic input to this part of striatum, which raises many questions about how the circuit functions. So today I'll present work that directly tests and challenges this modular feedforward hypothesis. And from the get-go, we can make several concrete predictions. So first, under the ADS to FOF proposal, there should be higher and earlier evidence information in ADS than in FOF. And to answer questions about the relative amounts of information and the interaction latencies, what we, uh, we uh, recorded simultaneously from the two regions using NeuroPixels probes, which let us sample hundreds of neurons simultaneously. Now, much to a surprise, we found using both encoding and decoding analysis that ADS is not privileged in the evidence information it carries, and instead both regions carry statistically similar amounts of evidence information. Moreover, we found that this information is not represented earlier in ADS, so the cross-correlation of the neurally inferred accumulated trajectories from the two regions shows no discernible lead lab relationship, and this symmetric shape suggests a recurrent relationship. So then we asked if this evidence information is at all communicated be uh, by the, between the two regions during accumulation. And we found that the information is communicated between the two regions, as we can decode it quite well from the communication subspace formed by the two regions during accumulation. So these findings contradict predictions of the feedforward hypothesis, but these observations are correlational. And there's still a possibility that this shared information is incidental and not required for making decisions as such. So for this, we need a causal test. Hence, we tested the second prediction of the feedforward proposal, that the FOF to ADS projection, the feedback projection under this hypothesis, should have no causal role during the accumulation process. So for this, we silenced FOF's axon terminals in striatum during time periods that differentially overlap with the two computations, just like in the studies before. And we found that this projection does play a role in the task, and it introduces an ipsilateral bias throughout the accumulation process, so both in the first and the second halves. I want to pause and point out how weird these results are, because during accumulation, inactivation of the whole FOF does not produce an effect throughout accumulation, but inactivations of its projections does. So how does inactivating a subset of FOF's output projections paradoxically reveal more of a role for FOF in the accumulation process. I'm going to come back to this later. So altogether, our experimental results are not consistent with the hypothesized feedforward hierarchy and instead suggest that the two regions might be accumulating evidence in a distributed fashion through recurrence and feedback, which could yield redundancy in representations and allow for complex responses to perturbations. Therefore, we translated our findings into a multi-region recurrent neural network model whose connectivity were constrained by known corticostriatal anatomy, Dale's law, and EI composition. Arriving at this model, which has a left and a right hemisphere with separate subnetworks representing FOF, ADS, and the striatocortical relay. We successfully trained this RNN to capture patterns of animal behavior on control, as well as unilateral perturbations trial. And this method of training with perturbations helped further impart regional specialization into the network. And as you can see, unilateral inactivations of these subnetworks produces distinct effects on behavior, much like the real data. And once trained, this model correctly predicted several features of the neural data that it wasn't trained on. 
So for instance, here I'm showing how the model FOF and ADS show similar redundancy in the time course and extents of stimulus and choice decoding, much like the real data. In addition to these representational similarities, perhaps even more excitingly, the model also predicted the effects of unseen per perturbations that it wasn't trained on. So we had trained the network on unilateral inactivations of FOF. So bilateral inactivations of FOF offered a good test case. So data that we had collected separately showed bilateral inactive FOF inactivations, much like the unilateral, unilateral ones, are robust to perturbations in the first half. But previous modeling work has suggested that RNNs with symmetric hemispheres are robust to unilateral, but not bilateral perturbations. So there was a good chance that the network would fail at capturing this data. But impressively, bilateral inactivations of a network do match the data, suggesting that the trained network mimics the robustness properties of the biological circuit. So we dug deeper into this by looking at the network's dynamics during these perturbations. So here I'm plotting models population activity in PC space, with darker colors being later time points in a trial. During unilateral inactivations of FOF in the first half, the population activity first deviates, but once the inactivation it over, is over, it recovers towards the control trajectories, driving the correct decision and resulting in no inactivation effects. We do not see such a recovery following inactivations of FOF's projections to ADS. So here you can see that during inactivation, the population activity on rightward trials in orange does not recover and instead incorrectly evolves towards network states that drive leftward choices in blue and purple. So to investigate what supports this recovery, we silenced all possible input projections to model FOF. And these in silico experiments reveal that robustness to perturbations is supported not by the sensory inputs, or by the inputs from the other hemisphere, but by the recur recurrent feedback into the model FOF from model ADS through this cortical relay. And these are uh, predictions that we can test experimentally. So we are currently working on understanding this model's dynamics in perturbed and unperturbed states, and we are hopeful that this model will be a powerful test bed to study how circuit of neuron-like elements might function while having these empirical properties. And with that, I'll summarize that we tested an influential hypothesis about a feed-forward implementation of evidence accumulation in the rat brain. We found evidence contrary to this hypothesis using simultaneous recordings and projection-specific perturbations. These instead revealed redundant representations and an unexpected role for corticosteroidal communication, which favors a distributed implementation of evidence accumulation. We synthesize these findings into an anatomically constrained multi-region recurrent neural network and by training it to capture perturbation effects. And we found that this model recapitulated physiology, effects to novel perturbations, and let us make predictions for future experiments. And we think that this approach offers a promising framework for understanding complex multi-region implementations of simple yet fundamental computations. And with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, especially my PhD advisor, Carlos Brody, and other members of the Brody Lab and Princeton Neuroscience Institute, whose feedback and support was absolutely critical for this work. And thanks to all of you. Thank you, thank you very much for this very clear talk. Are there any questions? Yes? Yes, I was wondering if you had any speculation as to why the cortex would be organized that way. What is the advantage of having those module and the specific connectivity for evidence accumulation? Do you think it's, I don't know, maybe it makes it more efficient, easier to optimize performance or anything along those lines? Sorry, could you speak a little closer? I'm, I'm getting like only bits of what you're saying. I was asking, can you speculate on why you think the cortex is organized the way it is organized here? Why not just have one RNN that does evidence accumulation and then a bound, as opposed to this distributed model that you're showing us? Is there any computational advantage of having such an architecture? So not that I, can, I know of, like you can do this task with one neuron if you wanted to. So it feels like the brain is optimized to do other functions and we're studying something very reduced. So we're seeing this like, very distributed activity in this simple sort of behavior that we are studying. So I don't know if a, maybe if we study more complex behaviors, we'll see why this is organized this way. But for now, I, I don't know. Yeah. 
Great. Thank you. Another question? Yes. If uh, evidence accumulation and thresholding are not anatomically separated, is there some sense in which there is an evidence accumulation subspace and a thresholding subspace or something like that? Um, so in this particular data set, we find that those are quite aligned. So uh, the, if you look, if you train decoders to try to look at which subspace is encoding the choice versus what is encoding the evidence, they seem to be quite aligned, which is not to rule out an area which carries just thresholded evidence uh, and not any information about the accumulated evidence. So here it seems very aligned. Great. Let's thank again our speaker. And our next speaker is Emmett Thompson, who will speak about procedural replay in dorsolateral striatum. Stay striatum. <clears throat> cool. Hello, everyone. And uh, hello to my mum, who's watching at home on the stream. Um, it's a real honour to be here. My name's Emmett Thompson. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student at the Sainsbury's Welcome Centre. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, newer mechanisms of memory consolidation. In particular, I'm interested in procedural memories. These are memories of movement patterns. So, for example, when unlocking a phone with a, a swipe code like this, you learn to perform this complex thumb dance, which can be performed without even thinking. Besides these procedural patterns, when we think about memory, we usually consider uh, episodic memories of experience. So, for example, consider uh, recalling your, your journey here to Kosan. These distinct forms of memory are known to rely on different brain regions. So while episodic memory formation uh, is dependent on the hippocampus, um, procedural memory is known to be dependent on the motor cortex and striatum. Despite relying on different structures, both share a common phenomenon. Um, they've improved and consolidated offline during sleep. For episodic memory, this is attributed to hippocampus-dependent reactivations, replay of previous activity that occurred uh, during previous uh, replay of activity that occurred during previous experience. For procedural memory, um, this offline consolidation mechanism is not so well understood. And so the, the uh, focus of this talk is in two parts. Firstly, we want to know whether a similar, albeit hippocampus-independent mechanism exists for consolidation of procedural memories. And secondly, if a parallel replay mechanism does exist, if it's not driven by hippocampal dynamics, uh, then what else could be orchestrating it? To study procedural memory in mice, we need to teach them a procedural task. Um, procedural behaviors are known to be composed composition, like these thumb swipes you chain together for your phone passcode. So we wanted a task with a very clear compositional structure just like this. Mice aren't so good with their thumbs, uh, so in our task, mice poke their nose into a series of five ports, and they receive reward at the final port. Mice learn this pretty quickly and get very good, so what you're seeing now is an expert animal performed, uh, performing a couple of trials. As I mentioned, the motor cortex and striatum are known to be important for procedural memory. In particular, it's well established that the motor cortex recipient portion of the striatum, the dorsolateral striatum, is essential for both learning and storage of procedural memory. Uh, and using lesions, we've confirmed that this is also true for our task. If this region is important for both learning and storage, is it also the site of an offline mechanism which consolidates procedural memory? To test this, we leverage the fact that corticostriatal uh, plasticity is known to be NMDA dependent. So to test if an offline uh, process supports this plasticity, we bilaterally implanted cannulas over our DLS region, and after training, we infuse either an NMDA blocker, AP5, or saline into this region. Uh, if offline plasticity supports learning here, then blocking NMDA uh, plasticity after mice have trained when they're resting should prevent the, the previous day's gains from being consolidated. And this is exactly what we find. So here, the, the black line is the training level of the mouse um, these stars are infusion time points, and the highlighted regions are test sessions 24 hours after infusion. So these dips in training level that you're seeing indicate that the animal's performance had dropped. And interestingly, when animals do drop, we find they on average drop back down to a level of performance that was seen the previous day. So this suggests that they've been unable to consolidate what they'd learned on the previous, days, the previous training day. Okay, so we have a procedural memory task, which is supported by an offline mechanism acting in the dorsolateral part of the striatum. What's happening offline in this region? As mentioned for episodic memory, consolidation is attributed to hippocampus-dependent replay of past activity. 
But previous work suggests the hippocampus is not involved in procedural learning, and we find the same thing is true for our task as well. So we, we bilaterally ablate the entire hippocampus uh, in our mice, and they have no learning deficit. Can then we find a procedural mechanism akin to episodic memory, uh, memory replay, but hip in independent from the hippocampus? To search for this, we recorded from the striatum by implanting neuropixel probes through this region. We recorded from animals doing uh, execution of the task and post-task sleep, and our aim is to search for reactivations of task-related activity just like this. For hippocampal replay, there are LFP biomarkers, so there's sharp wave ripples which indicate when, when replay is occurring. Um, but our mechanism is hippocampus independent, and we don't know what the biomarker is for striatal replay or have any prior understanding of what striatal offline dynamics look like. We're going in blind, and so we want to use an unsupervised method. This allows us to search for answers while making as few assumptions as possible. And the unsupervised method we used is an established point process model developed by Alex Williams in the Lindemann lab called PPSeq. Okay, so how do we apply this method? So here's an example of some striatal cells uh, simultaneously recorded during task execution, and you're seeing a, a, full, uh, a single full trial in blue. In order to search for replay, we aim to use PPSeq to identify task-related activity uh, that we can then search for reactivated offline during post-task sleep. We chose our PPSeq model with an extensive hyperparameter search, and then we feed our spiking activity into this model. PPSeq aims to describe um, the data by a series of repeating latent sequences, and it assigns spikes to elements of that structure. So when PPSeq has done its job, we can rearrange these spikes by their associated latent elements, um, and then task-related structural activity becomes clear. And in fact, PPSeq finds that this structure is best described by five distinct repeating neural motifs, each a temporal progression of spikes. And if we mark the endpoint of each trial with these blue lines, then we find that these five repeating neural motifs are aligned to distinct phases in the task. Okay, so let's take a closer look at uh, activity from two trials, and now we can see that there's actually four repeating motifs, red, green, yellow, and blue, and a fifth purple motif, um, which is only present on rewarded trials. So what are these motifs aligned to exactly? Well, in this uh, video, uh, I'm, I'm tracking the animal's movements across task execution, and I'm coloring in the tracking point by the current dominant PPSeq motif. And you can see these motifs very clearly aligned to four movement phases, and the remaining purple sequence seems to correspond to times when the mouse is drinking the reward. So above here, I'm showing uh, the uh, overlaid, uh, tracking trials overlaid, so you can see how robust this alignment is to each task phase. So as a reminder, this is unsupervised, so the PPSeq uh, model does not have any access to prior information about the structure of the task. Uh, these just pop out of the neural activity alone. Okay, so we find task-related structure with these distinct task-related neural motifs. Do we find the same activity recapitulated offline? Our approach is to use the online recordings as a template, so we apply the same model trained on the awake data to offline periods. When we do this, PPSeq identifies periods of offline activity that matches that seen during the task. And these identified putative replay events are diverse, so we find multiple uh, motifs chained together in task order. Um, we also find single motifs um, we played alone, as well as several motifs we played out of order, and we even find strings of motifs in reverse order. Um, but we also, uh, sorry, like hippocampal replay, we find our identified events are usually found uh, be replayed faster than the same dynamics offline. Um, but we also find replay at real-world speeds. So this here shows the proportion of events that PPSeq finds at different replay speeds. We also allow PPSeq to flip the activity. So again, like hippocampal replay, in blue you can see events that are best described by reversed dynamics at different speeds. That we find replay at different uh, awake speeds or slower is actually consistent with recent findings in the hippocampus using very sensitive decoding methods. Uh, so that we find the same thing we think points to the sensitivity of our approach. We chose PPC because we wanted an unsupervised method, but how can we validate uh, that our replay instances are real uh, and not just spurious labeling by the model? Well, first, we ask PPC to look for events after we shuffle the, the neuron order in our sleep recordings, and we find that replay completely disappears. So PPC isn't just labeling noise as replay. Um, secondly, we've tested the replay we found by comparing our results to those of a Bayesian decoder, which is the current standard model for replay detection in the field. So here's an example of a decoded replay trajectory during sleep, and the same uh, trajectory labeled spikes from PPC. Um, and we find all decoder-identified replay matched a PPC-identified uh, event. Okay, so we found procedural re reactivations. What could be driving and orchestrating these offline dynamics? The first step to understanding this is to search for an LFP biomarker. In the hippocampus, 
Replay is associated with sharp wave ripple markers, um, but we know our consolidation is hippocampus independent. Um, so can we find an, an LFP marker, uh, biomarker for procedure replay? In the literature, we find four LFP candidates split into two frequency band groups, delta waves and spindles. To test whether any of these events are associated with our detected replay, we filter for these frequency bands, and then we average this filtered activity for all replay events. When we do this, we find replays associated with delta band oscillations and increased fast spindle amplitudes, but not slow spindles. In fact, we find that replays usually associated with a combinatorial nesting between different kinds of delta event and spindle. And this is very interesting because previous evidence suggests uh, that uh, nesting, differential nesting between these, these, two, these different de delta events drives opposite effects on memory, either consolidation or weakening. Since we see both of these kind of nesting events associated with our PPC identified replay events, an interesting idea is that these, this, the uh, hierarchical LFP nesting may define the characteristics of the replay that we observe. This is analysis that's ongoing, but we hope to use this to, to find a kind of functional syntax for replay events, try to link together not only what's happening offline, um, but also what these reactivation events could mean functionally for memory. In summary, we've used an unsupervised method based on a point process model to identify procedure replay in the dorsal lateral striatum. Identified replay had diverse characteristics and shared many features with a previously identified hippocampal replay. However, we find our mice had no procedural memory deficits after hippocampal ablation, so it suggests that procedural replay is completely independent of hippocampus. In future work, we aim to uh, confirm if this is true by recording from our hippocampal ablated mice and seeing if the replay is unchanged. We also looked for LFP biomarkers associated with our reactivations. Uh, when we do this, we find replays associated with increased fast spindle amplitude and is locked to different delta band upstates. These upstates have been uh, associated with differential influences on consolidation, and so this raises the possibility that different kinds of replay are associated with differential LFP nestings. Again, this is something we plan to look into in, in future work. Thank you for listening. Uh, this work's been done in collaboration with a great team of people from the Gatsby and the St. Jude Welcome Centre, so I want to extend my thanks to all of them for their hard work, uh, and thanks for inviting me here and for listening. Great. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Yes? Hi. This is really exciting work. Uh, I'm wondering how are these replay events related to learning? And do you see, while the task is progressing, do you see any change in the events or the frequency of events or so on? Yeah, this isn't something we've, we've looked into uh, at all. So, um, but it's, it's something we, we definitely want to, to look into acro across learning, whether there's a change. Because, um, yeah, an exciting idea is that we, we have all these replay characteristics. Is there, a, is there a certain kind of characteristic that's associated with, a, with learning or with stabilization of memory or weakening of memory? Um, this is something we want to look into, but yeah, so far uh, it's a bit premature in the analysis to, to give you a, a good answer, really. Next question, please. A very nice talk. Um, did I understand correctly? So you're recording from the stride, I'm here. Is that right? Yes, dorsal lateral yeah. stride. So the replay. Um, uh, as far as I understand, the striatum itself doesn't have the lateral connectivity, lateral excitatory recurrence that would be able to generate mm. a replay like this. So is your model uh, that this is all driven by cortical inputs that are sequential? And so then the cortex has formed a uh, simfire chain-like thing that is prop just propagating down to the striatum? Yeah, so that's, we have recordings because our neuropixel probe goes through motor cortex, so I'm showing you only striatal neurons at the moment, but we plan to look into what's happening in motor cortex. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting and complicated story because uh, there's evidence that motor cortex, when you're learning these things, shuts down. So this is from Ben Solvetsky's lab. So uh, these mice are quite late in training when we're recording from them. So, at this point, we may, we, you may expect the motor cortex to no longer be involved in, in uh, generating the, the task online. So whether it has a role offline is unclear. Um, but yes, for sure, uh, striatum is not spontaneously active, so this activity must be being given to it from somewhere else. Whether that's cortex or thalamus is unclear to us at this point. Thanks. One, one last question. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, and uh, hello, Emmett's mum. Just a quick question. <laughs> How did you uh, train the rats exactly to be able to do that sequence task? Uh, yeah, so uh, we basically have a, a series of levels. So it's, all, it's an automated training schema. So they start like a video game at level, at level zero, and they're guided with light uh, and with reward at each port. 
And then as they get better at the task, doing the, the full sequence as well, uh, perfectly, basically, we, they move automatically up through the levels until the final level, there's no lights, no reward apart from the final port, and they just do this thing from memory only. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's thanks again our speaker. And our last speaker of the session, Amelia Christensen, who will speak about unsupervised discovery of a decision-making algorithm. Many seconds. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you guys about the work that I've been doing over the past couple of years in the Kepesh lab. Um, so to start off, I wanted to say, I think most of us would agree that when we study some behavior, like for example, decision making, um, our goal is not just to predict what decision our subjects will arrive at, but we also want to understand how the subjects arrived at their answer. We want to know the algorithm. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, we can start off by correlating single neurons with various experimentally controlled variables. Um, and this approach, in principle, actually has major advantages. It's simple, it's composable, and it's pretty interpretable. But in reality, as we record more and more neurons, it becomes wildly under-constrained by the data, and we can often find neural correlates of basically every imaginable variable everywhere in the brain as sort of a neuron soup. Um, so this combination of lots of neuron soup and increasing tools for recording neural populations had led to the sort of overwhelming popularity of these population-based approaches. We all do it, we all love it. Um, but also simultaneously, the field has made enormous progress understanding the patterns of brain circuitry on like micro, meso, and macro scales. And this circuit architecture can be low rank, uh, and it can even have like long range structure that's categorical. And this is really at odds with the assumptions that implicitly underlie most population-based approaches. Um, so, in the next 10 minutes, I have a sort of ambitious goal to tell you about a new approach that I've been working on in my postdoc with Adam um, Kapesh that tries to wed the benefits of all these approaches. That's a big goal. Uh, so, what I want to start is to do is just move the goalpost way, way closer. Um, and I want to instead set out to understand how rats evaluate their own decision confidence um, when they're investing time waiting for an uncertain reward. Uh, so I'm going to start off by quickly telling you about the experimental setup. And if you were in Adam's talk this morning, you can like pass out and grab a coffee for the next one to two minutes while I get everyone caught up. Um, so we start with a rat, and it's in a box with three ports, totally standard, fair. And uh, when it pokes in the center port, it initiates a stimulus. In this case, the stimulus is the auditory Poisson's task, where this click train is coming from either side of the box. Um, and as usual, the rat's job is to report which side had the higher click rate by poking in the port on that side of the box. So importantly, um, we don't immediately reward the rats. This is the, the big trick. Um, and instead, on each trial, the reward is randomly delayed up to eight seconds. And the rat receives no indication, other than not getting a reward, uh, when they make an error. Uh, so the rat pokes in the side that it thinks is the correct answer, and it waits, and it waits. And eventually, the rat must choose to leave the reward port and initiate a new trial because it's thirsty and you know, maybe on the next trial, the stimulus will be easier or the reward will become more quickly. Okay, so more formally, in order to receive maximum rewards in a session, the rat should leave the reward part when it thinks the probability of receiving a reward is less than the expected value of the reward it'll get if it starts a new trial. So compute this, um, the rat needs to estimate the probability that it got the trial correct, so it's decision confidence. Um, the external distribution of reward times, so, so you know, the thing I'm controlling, um, and the expected value of leaving, uh, or in other words, its opportunity cost of staying. Um, the idea is that we can come, the rat can combine those variables together, um, the, in particular, decision confidence and the temporal reward expectation are combined to make this uh, uh, reward expectation, which then it can compare to the opportunity cost and decide when to leave. Okay, um, so that means on trials where there's a higher probability of being correct, rats should wait longer. And um, as Adam told you about this morning, that's exactly what we see when we look at the rats' data. So on difficult trials where rats are close to chance, they don't wait very long. But on easy trials, when they're almost perfect, they can wait a really, really long time. Um, so yeah, sorry, I should have 
click. There's the data for that. Um, so uh, we know from previous work in the Kevish lab that OFC is totally critical for uh, appropriately investing time based on decision confidence. Um, and I told you about one potential method that you could arrive at a leaving decision. But what we want to know is, like, how do the rats do it? And how do their neurons do it? Um, so to answer that question, we started off by reporting populations of LOFC neurons in the time investment task. Um, and for today, you'll just have to believe me when I tell you that in this task, uh, there are a few motifs of single neuron dynamics that turn up again and again and again in every rat we record. Um, so this means we can use unsupervised clustering on just the patterns of dynamics to separate out neurons into groups. And since our goal is to understand the algorithms of behavior, having single trial estimates of neural activity is totally crucial. Um, and to me, this is a really major advantage of the whole like clustering business, is it lets us average over neurons in a cluster instead of averaging over trials. And that means that we get really nice single trial data. It's actually really nice. Um, so here I'm showing you single trial cluster averages sorted by wait time for the four clusters that are modulated during the time investment phase of the task. So the first cluster is one that I call the rainbow or the plateau cluster. And this cluster just does kind of like a nice slow rise and fall um, uh, during the entire time investment phase. And the length of that rise and fall is longer or shorter, depending on how long the time investment is. Um, then there's a down ramp cluster, which peaks and then decreases, an up ramp cluster, which starts low and then goes high. And then there's a cluster that I decided last night, sorry, Adam, to call the GTFO cluster, um, because this cluster stays like low for a really, really long time. And then right before the rat leaves, it sort of does this exponential kick up, like the rat saying, I'm done. Um, OK, uh, so we can um, calculate just how nice those are. We want to quantify it. So we, as we increase the number of neurons simultaneously recorded, uh, we can explain up to 90% of the explainable trial-to-trial -trial variance. Um, that puts us in a pretty cool situation where we have these like nice single trial um, thing, uh, single trial cluster averages. And it gave us the idea that maybe the clusters are sort of the computational unit, which is doing this computation. So we wanted to reframe the initial question. Uh, do LOFC clusters contribute to time investment? Um, and we had the idea of a pretty crazy twist to the whole fit an RNN to the neural data and then analyze the network to discover the dynamics um, uh, way of analyzing data. Um, that is, we were going to treat each cluster as a unit, and we we're going to train a four-unit RNN to generate the dynamics. Um, so for the aficionados in the audience, this is actually a variational recurrent autoencoder with GRU units. And it's an architecture which is basically an extremely tiny LFADS. So there's four encoder units, a single four-unit latent vector, and four decoder units. The four decoder units autonomously generate the output based on initial conditions set by the latent vector. And the output of each unit is tied to the activity of the cluster. So there's no fully connected layer. Um, so that leads to a grand total of 12 parameters that are available for the model to learn to generate the dynamics and then, you know, plus the encoder parameters, which it uses to sort of generate the embedding. Uh, so miraculously, this works really well. Um, I did not think it was going to work. This was just the first thing I tried. Um, so the model outputs single trial traces that really capture the temporal dynamics of the clusters. Uh, and we can take the peak of the ramping cluster as a prediction of when the animals will leave. Um, and given that, we can predict when the animals will leave the reward port over eight seconds in advance on held out data. And I have to say, I'm really not kidding when I say this blew my mind. Um, but I don't have very much time, so I want to sort of skip to telling you how does the model work. Um, so if you recall, I told you that the optimal waiting time is computed by comparing the reward expectation to the opportunity cost at each time step. It's not quite what the model does, but it's actually astonishingly close. Um, so the basic idea is you have two competing integrators. One is the down ramp cluster, and the other is the up ramp cluster. And in sort of dynamical systems words, uh, there's two phases of the dynamics. One is an integration phase, which is a sort of slow zone in the dynamics. Uh, and the other is a rotation phase. And the variation in timing is totally determined by the amount of time in the integration phase. And the rotation phase always takes the same amount of time. Um, so uh, the decision confidence and the uh, opportunity cost sort of spread the dynamics out in this sort of slow zone. Um, the uh, 
how do we arrive at those conclusions? Well, because there's only four units in the model, we can perturb every combination of, of uh, units and clamp every combination of units and, um, or, and sort of understand exactly how things work. Um, so for example, the up ramping and the down ramping clusters sort of mutually inhibit each other. Um, and if we perturb the plateau cluster at the very beginning of the uh, time investment phase, then this leads to really big changes down the line uh, for the amount of time that the model invests. And um, if we look at the activity of neurons in that cluster, it turns out all the confidence neurons that I'm told you about, or most of them are actually in that cluster. So that we think that the sort of confidence that's the initial conditions of the, um, the sort of plateau cluster. Uh, and we think that the, um, the sort of opportunity cost sets the initial conditions of the sort of uh, GTFO cluster. And then those two are sort of competingly integrated by the up ramping and the down ramping cluster. Um, that went by really, really fast. And I hope if you guys are interested in this, you talk to me about it later. Um, but uh, TLDR, our model predicts that LOC dynamics implement an almost normative race between two integrators. It's not what we expected, but it's very, very close. Um, and by taking the idea of functional clusters as a computational unit seriously, we can explain a big chunk of uh, OFC, neural and behavioral variance. Um, and this sort of leads us to this idea as, of clusters as the unit. Um, and this is interpretable and it's testable and it's really, really practical because you get this sort of low dimensional, not noisy thing that you can work with. Um, and Adam talked a little bit in his talk about how we're working on ways to sort of go back in and test that in the neural data itself. So I just want to close by saying, um, I, I don't know if this approach is going to be right at the end of the day, but I think it's a really, really good place to start. And it gives us a very good handle on understanding um, these types of complicated comp computations. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Yes. To we can start. Yes. Hi. So, very, very nice. So, how, how, why do you think you need all this brain if you can explain things so simply with so few uh, units? Well, it's, I mean, so individual neurons are quite noisy on single trials, right? Um, and I, I, so there's also something I didn't talk about in this. So like, if you consider a unit, quote unit, it's not, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping of unit in the artificial neural network to unit in the brain, and it's going the other direction. People usually think artificial neural network units are uh, too simple. I made them too complicated. Um, so you know, there's a lot of biological units in my one unit. And for example, my one unit doesn't obey Dale's law. So there's both inhibitory and excitatory connections coming out of each unit. Um, yeah, that, that's just a couple of thoughts. I think uh, robustness to noise is a really a, one big reason to have lots of neurons. Thank you. Next question. Um, hi, uh, two short questions actually. Uh, how do you go about choosing the number of clusters? And uh, how many units were like sort of left out of the loop versus very clearly in one of the clusters in, uh, yeah. in this work? Those are both great questions. Okay, first, how did I choose the number of clusters? Okay, so. I, the first step is like we cluster the entire OFC population and we choose the parameters for clustering, including the number of clusters based off of a cross validation approach where I sort of leave out half the trials. Uh, and then I sort of recluster and recluster and recluster and look at agreement between the cluster labels. Um, so that's how I choose the number of overall clusters. There's 12 overall clusters. And then there's this time investment phase and I look at which clusters are active. Um, and that just means like which cluster has uh, explainable variance during that phase of the trial. And there's only four clusters that have explainable variance during that phase of the trial. The other clusters are really reliable at other phases of the trial, but just not in that time investment phase. Um, and I did refit the model with like every um, And the, using just those four is the best you can do. Great. Last question. Hi, uh, I have a question about what is the input like uh, when you run this RN? Like, is it um, throughout uh, when you like try to monitor uh, like throughout a trial? You always have external input. No, there's well, uh, okay. The input is the just the beginning of the the time investment period, so that you just four four things or four numbers times I don't know eighty samples or something like that are input, um, 
And uh, that's just the first like half a second to a second of the time investment period for each cluster. And I'm never predicting data that uh, includes that. That's just setting the initial conditions of the decoder. And at the end of the day, you get four numbers out, which set the initial conditions of the decoder. That's what comes out of the latent vector. Great. Let's thank again our speaker. And before leaving, there is an announcement. Just a quick announcement, and then we close the session. Thank you. We, I'm Mark Reimers. This is Hadas Benesti. As we've been sitting here, we've seen people take large amounts of data, uh, slice and dice and process them and present them in these amazing, almost singing and dancing kinds of presentations. And we'd all love to be able to do that. So I would encourage you to come out. We have a course, summer course at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, lovely ocean views uh, and uh, swimming. Please come out this summer and uh, we'll learn how, how to do this. What's the wizard, you know, what's the mechanism behind the wizardry? Let's lift the curtain, find out how do you make this kind of stuff work? Please join us. And if you'd like to have any questions, ask either Hadas or myself. Thank you. Thank you.
starting to Okay, kids, the last time we talked, we were extremely uncomfortable about where Tumblr Probably not giving them all the same. Like to maybe we'll come to that a bit. And the thing I find is that unless you've been trying to learn to do it in this job, I don't find it very much. We don't have a show for a couple of seconds. We can try it. There's a little area where I'm fixing it for you. There are two layers, two half layers on each floor. Yeah, I know that you have to. There's no screen behind me to make the waiting break. It's good to have that recap. I just didn't want to. What? Yeah. Already signed. I told her to stick around. Ready? Ready to go. Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the next session. Let's have your attention, please, for our next speaker, who is Demba Ba from Harvard University. Thank you very much, Demba. All right, thank you for having me. I want to start my talk by giving a shout out to Jess Carden and Blake Richards, the chairs of this conference, and for so well putting together the schedule. And I also want to start this by reading a quote, so from epistemology. I'll read it, we're in Montreal, Canada, bilingual. I'll read it in French first and then I will read this in English. So the quote says, Puisque la science est toujours inachevée, la, la philosophie des savants reste toujours plus ou moins éclectique, toujours ouverte, toujours précaire. Which can be roughly translated as, since science is always incomplete, the philosophy of scientists always remains more or less eclectic, always open, always on the brink. And I picked this quote to share with you because when Jess and Blake invited me to speak here, it actually took me a while before I decided to say yes. And what pushed me over the edge, over the brink, was a conversation with Jess and where I asked Jess, I mean, what do you want from me? Like, what can I do to help what you're trying to accomplish during the conference? And she got me from the beginning when she said that, I want you to talk about something different. We want to hear different ideas. And I'm hoping that I can accomplish this for you during my talk. And by something different, what I mean is, so, and this is, not just, this is not just a topic that comes up these days in neuroscience. 
And if there's one takeaway from my talk, it's the fact that what I'm about to talk about comes up in all areas of science. We're all excited about deep learning. Everybody wants to use it to solve scientific problems and to answer questions. So in the middle of all this excitement, I hope my talk convinces you that it's probably time for us to step back a little bit and give some thought to what we would like these things to accomplish for us in a scientific contest. So to set the stage, I want us to agree at a very high level as to what components of a neuroscience experiment are at a very, very high level. And I will use this to contrast what I think of as two errors in the analysis of data in science and the analysis of data in neuroscience. So at a broad level, we have organisms. We present these organisms with stimuli, as I'll talk about in a bit, these stimuli may be implicit or explicit, and this is going to be important. We record neural activity with a myriad modalities. I've only named a few here, electrophysiology, calcium imaging, photometry, and so on and so forth. We also collect behavior at times. And these days, we also collect things such as video and so on and so forth to monitor animals and to monitor behavior in an automatic fashion. Two main things I think we're interested in, and I'll focus on one today because I see the second one of these as a dual of the first one. Encoding. We want to be able to map these recordings of neural activity and stimuli, which may be implicit, this is important, I'll come to this in a second, to some quantification of the effect of stimuli, exogenous stimuli, on this neural activity. One reason why we want to do this is decoding. There are myriad other reasons that we might want to do this, such as understand how brain regions or multiple regions understand the computations that they make that lead them from stimulus to the neural activity that we can record. What are these two errors that I refer to? So if you go back to the early 2000s, perhaps a little earlier, I want to, well, I understand that Performing experiments is a difficult task. I have friends that are experimentalists. So when I say that in the early 2000s, we were doing simple experiments, here's what I mean. I, meant, I mean that we performed experiments in very structured setting, for example, with head-fixed animals. Right? This has changed to today, where we're trying to understand the brain in natural settings, and we're performing what I'm describing as complicated, or perhaps they should have said more complicated experiments in settings where the animals are freely behaving. And in the abstract I shared with the organizer, something else happened from the computational perspective. So we've gone from one era experimentally to another one. Computationally, I believe we've gone from one era to another one too. And we could talk about correlation or causation and I'll save that discussion to offline. So in this first era where I describe experiments as simples, right? We also had what I call simple models for estimating this mapping from what I call stimulus effects X into the neural activity that we record, right? In these simple settings where we have access to the stimuli and we can control them to a certain degree, we could use that stimulus age to compute handcrafted features that we could then feed to something like a GLM or your favorite encoding model to sort of understand this mapping from exogenous stimuli into neural activity. And I call these models simple, and more importantly, I call them interpretable. So we've moved now to the era on the right. Well, pretty much everybody has, if, you, if the person that hasn't will likely have difficulty getting any funding, right? We've moved to an era where we have now complicated models that I've caricatured here as this multi-layer architecture with a bunch of blocks and some nonlinearities in the middle. But the most important thing is that now that we're performing experiments in freely behaving animals, where the stimuli are what I'm calling implicit, the animal is just running around doing its thing, perhaps in some tasks that we're interested in. We do not necessarily have control over the stimuli that are presented to the animal. So in these settings, I want us to think of the stimuli as implicit, right? We don't have control over them. There's something that's hidden and that we don't have control over. But we still, we're still interested in this problem of figuring out a mapping from stimulus effects or implicit stimuli that we do not have control over into neural activity. 
And what I think we've lost, one of the things we've lost that I'll try to convince you over the next few slides before I actually go into concrete examples as to how we can recover this, what I think we've lost in the middle is interpretability. So we have models that are very good at generating data. We don't necessarily understand what they do. And in my opinion, this hinders our ability to answer basic questions about science, basic questions about neural computation in the neuroscience setting. All right. So I changed the title to my talk uh, compared to the one that's actually in the program. And the title that I use has a pun on how will we plant our stakes in this AI spring? So they say it's the AI spring, right? We came back from winter, right? How are we going to plant stakes now? And what I mean here is that if you think of science in general, let's, so this slide here is meant to be a statement about science in general. So we record data why. We perform experiments, whether you're a neuroscientist, whether you're a biologist. I work with experimental physicists. We all collect data why. What we're interested in, really, is some nonlinear function from some latent space into the data that we collect, and that nonlinear function being parameterized by some par parameters that I simplify here and just call H. This might be some very, very complicated function from the me mechanisms we're interested in into the data that we can actually record. So in the world that I come from, encoding, what we call encoding, so I have a second life in signal processing, we call this inverse problem. So this is a problem of going from data that you acquire to an assessment of latent quantities that have an incidence on these data that you acquire. So the question that I want to ask in this slide is, in, in science, and particularly in a neuroscience setting, right? And in a day where increasingly we're using artificial neural networks we do not necessarily understand to implement, to solve these inverse problems, to implement these encoding procedures, right? I just want us to think about, maybe for 30 seconds while I talk here, what do we want these mappings to satisfy? What do we want from these architectures? What do we want them to tell us? What do we want data models to satisfy? What do we want these latent representations to satisfy as properties, right? And a quick day tour that's going to help motivate what I think we want them to satisfy. So the dirty secret of AI and deep learning, especially supervised learning, is that our pockets and pun intended are just not deep enough. Labeled data cost money. So I'm contrasting two things here. On the left-hand side, is what I call machine learning for natural signals. This is your clip architecture. This is your chat GPT or neural networks that can do things such as map you from this sentence in French, je donne un cours, to the equivalent sentence in English, a lecture, or that can take this image of a ladybug and come up with a textual description of it. The cost it takes to label this, to have one training pair for this, order of magnitude a dollar, five dollars. I would probably take you could probably pay me three or four dollars to translate back and forth between French and English in terms of how much my time costs. Let's go to the right hand side. So an MRI, order of magnitude, costs about a thousand dollars. It costs about a thousand dollars for you to get into the scanner. Speaking to an experimentalist friend of mine, I think this is a number that's on the lower side. If you think about, if you take into account the cost of paying staff, right? the cost of maintaining animal facilities, and so on and so forth. It probably costs you about $500 a day to perform an experiment on a mouth, and I think this is an underestimate. So the point being here is that there's an order of magnitude in terms of how much it would actually cost us to acquire data. So in my previous slide here, when I'm talking about, let's think about what we want these architectures to satisfy, your argument could be, you know what, Demba, let's just throw lots of data at it, because that's what you do at deep learning. The question is, we just don't have pockets deep enough to be in situations where we do this. And when we don't have enough data, what do we do? We have, from a st st statistics perspective, we have to think about models. We have to think about how do we constrain these architectures that we're trying to build in order to squeeze as much as possible from the data that we can actually acquire. There are other reasons why you might want to think about this. Interpretability is one of them that's particularly important in science. And I would argue also in some of these applications of ML to natural signals, but the jury's out on that. And another interesting thing that we do not think about enough in science is this idea that even if we could collect infinitely many data, right, we're dealing with dynamic systems. We're in settings where we're not in a, to talk technical here, we're not in an IID settings. These examples we're feeding these architectures. When you're performing the experiment today on the mouth, 
Who am I to say that the state of the mouse is the same the next day or in 10 days and so on and so forth? So things are dynamic, right? So we're never really in this large end setting. By definition or by design, we're in these small end settings. And I think this is not just occurring in neuroscience. This occurs in a lot of areas that I call engineering-based and science-based areas. So what do we want these things to satisfy? In my opinion, so let's think about data models. We want the mapping from these latent quantities, for example, an assessment of how stimuli impact neural activity into neural activity. We want this to be rich and expressive. And this is one thing that deep learning does well. It allows you to express a rich set of functions. Fantastic. I think we want them to be interpretable, particularly if what we're after is mechanisms and what the nature of computations that lead us from these latent representations of stimuli into the neural activity. If we go here on the side of latent representations, I think we also want these to be interpretable. And what I mean by interpretability is that we would like to be able to relate these to things such as behavior, right, that we can measure through video and so on and so forth, right? And with these black box architectures, such as the one that I've drawn here below, I think we've lost what I've highlighted in red here. So what I want to propose to you is for us to entertain this idea of sparsity, and I'm going to mainly talk about sparsity in time. Towards the end of my talk, I'll broaden my perspective on sparsity. Can we think about sparsity in space and time as mild forms of inductive biases that we can impose on architectures? What do I mean? So our dominant way of thinking about these architectures, in my opinion at the moment, is what I'm showing on the left-hand side here. Here I'm showing a caricature of a single trial of neural activity that's fed into a DNN. Notice how this DNN pinches. It maps you to a lower dimensional space. That's reasonable. I don't think that's unreasonable, right? And it fans back out to map you to something like an estimate of rate at the single trial level or an estimate of the neural activity. I want to contrast this to what's on the right-hand side here. And if all what you get from my talk is this slide, I would have done my job right. So we still have single trial neural activity that's being fed into some kind of an architecture. But notice how this architecture on the right-hand side does not fan out. Actually, in a lot of the cases that we've worked on, it expands, right? But what's interesting, it expands into a higher dimensional space. But in that higher dimensional space, you still man maintain some level of low dimensionality through sparsity. Right? Which I've shown here through these three black dogs. And what's interesting is that we have both of these sets of architectures can both reconstruct rates well. But one has a description that I call rich and interpretable in two senses. A, my latent representation has a natural temporal dimension. I can go back and correlate this to any other temporal sequences that I can measure in experiments. While if I look at architectures on the left-hand side here, I've put in a question mark here, what does this latent representation actually mean, right? In my case, I have a natural temporal interpretation of that uh, dimension. And what's interesting is that you can get these architectures, the one on the left-hand side and on the one on the right-hand side, to reconstruct the data as well as each other. Right? So I think the thought that needs to be put in is what do we want in that latent space? And when I say sparsity, I'm going to focus on very restrictive forms of sparsity here today. I just mean low dimensional representation in high dimensional spaces that we can interpret. Space, time are the most natural variables that we can interpret. There's a growing literature on this that we haven't paid attention much in science and in the neuroscience community in particular. My colleague at MIT who works on computational imaging where there are a lot of physics involved. They have to think about these things. George Barber Statis, he has a very nice paper on this, on the use of deep learning for computational imaging. Jan LeCun has a recent paper on the topic. And actually, the work of LeCun's that got me and my student Bahari started thinking about this actually dates back to late 2010. I don't show it here. Um, and in our group, we have some work on this topic, but obviously we're not the only ones. How are you doing? Fantastic. So before I go into the rest of the talk and actually tell you about a few technical ideas, I want to acknowledge some of the amazing scientists that have worked on this with me. I want to first thank my student Bahari, who's sitting at the front here, and who will talk after Jonathan Pillow here, 
who just uh, defended their PhD thesis. And the, the ideas that I'm going to talk about today at a high level, we've exposed them in our papers, and we've, we've exposed them in a manner that I think is very clear in Bahari's PhD thesis titled Deep Learning for Inverse Problems in Engineering and Science. I want to thank Paul Masset, who's actually the one who pushed us and who convinced us that, you know what, some of these ideas might actually be interesting to the neuroscience community. Let's try to explore that in details. Sarah Matias, also from Now Cheetahs Lab, now who's sitting here somewhere in the audience. Venki Murthy as well has been instrumental in uh, helping me, convincing me that some of these ideas are worth expanding and thinking about in the neuroscience setting. And my student, Andrew Song, who defended about a year and a half ago. All right. So neuroscience data analysis in the age of deep learning. So to expose these ideas that I've talked about at a high level, I want us to think about one simple two example that we can all relate to as neuroscientists. If you're doing electrophysiology, unless you're recording from inside a neuron, you have to think about spike sorting. So what I want us to think about over the next few slides is just the following very, very simple question. If you wanted to design one of these encoder decoder architectures for spike sorting, how would you do it? It's just a simple thing that I wanna, want us to think about. And what I want to submit to you is that in this, in the simple settings such as spike sorting, which by the way, it's just a simple example of what in inverse problems and signal processing are called source separation problems. Towards the end of the talk, I'll show you this. This happens everywhere in science, in astrophysics, in the analysis of biological data. We're not the only ones dealing, that, dealing with this. And one important form of bias, explicit bias, that you can impose on architectures to solve these problems is this idea of time and sparsity. I would like to take this recording from a single electrode here that has two nearby neurons, a yellow one and a blue one, and do what? And map it to two time series, one which will let me know when events from the blue neuron happen and with what amplitude, and one which will let me know when events from the yellow neuron happen and with what amplitude, but also I would like to obtain an estimate of the signatures of these neurons. So what I'll show you in the next few slides, I'm not gonna have time to go to too much of the details of the math. They're in our papers. You can talk to Bahari, myself, and Paul offline about this. I want to show you a recipe for if I wanted to design an architecture to perform spike sorting in an unsupervised fashion, how do I do this? With this idea of having sparsity and time as inductive biases in the hidden layers of these architectures. So what's my starting point? My starting point is we're going to posit a very simple generative model of recordings from electrodes. And again, right, so the simplicity of what I will describe, you can make it more complicated. My goal is to convey some of the main ideas. So assume we have three sources that are neighboring the electrode, right? We're going to assume that each of these has a signature, right, these H1s, and here denotes discrete time. That's my temporal variable. And we're going to assume that Associated with each of these signatures is what I'm calling sparse codes or sparse time series, one for each neuron. What do these do? They tell me when events from a single neuron occurred and with what amplitude. And the fact that these amplitudes are roughly the same should not fool you. We can let them vary, right? So starting here, I'm going to posit a very simple model that we can make more complicated. I'm going to say that the data that I record, y of n, this time series, is the superposition of these signatures convolve with the sparse codes in the presence of noise. What does convolution with sparse codes do? Convolution with sparse codes, it takes the shape and it puts it at a location where the codes are non-zero and it scales them by the corresponding amplitude. We can write this in linear algebraic form. So you'll have to believe me with this. We can write this as a vector y, which is my full time series, equals some matrix h times a large vector x plus noise. The matrix H is what's called the topless matrix. Its degrees of freedom are as many parameters as the signatures of the neurons have. It's not the full size of the matrix. And the vectors x's are what encode when events occur from each neuron and with what amplitude. What's our goal? Our goal is just give me data. Why? I want to design an architecture that will recover these neural signatures, those filters, and will also sort the spikes for me. All right, so mathematically, in the theoretical work, world that I come in, this is called the convolutional dictionary learning problem. The dictionary of these signatures for neurons is convolutional because of the model that I just showed you. 
And it's a convolutional dictionary learning problem where I'm going to impose two forms of biases. I'm going to impose a bias from my interpretable model, which is this convolutional general mo generative model, and I'm going to impose a sparsity bias. I want to reconstruct data well, subject to the constraint that these neurons are polite. They're not all going to be talking to each other. I know some of you are already thinking about bursting and things like bursting and things like that. We can handle this. I just want to expose this in the most simple form. So this is an optimization problem. And what Jay here denotes, this is just to simplify my life. Imagine you're recording over days. We're not going to be able to process the whole recording at once. We're just going to chunk it. These are the Js, right? And this par parameter lambda here allows me to control my level of sparsity. How am I doing? 15 minutes. Fantastic. So how do you solve this problem? So those of you that are from a math background will notice that this is not a convex optimization problem because I have the multiplication of two variables. So the way you solve this classically using an approach that's called alternating minimization. You start with a guess of these neural signatures. Given that guess, you solve what's called a convolutional sparse coding problem. Right? Start with a guess of the signatures. Where would ev what would event locations and amplitude be if my guess were good enough? That's what this problem does. Okay. And I want to do a quick aside here, which we're talking about with Bahari and Paul a couple of days ago, which is, so what's interesting to me is that sparse coding is actually an idea that's been around in neuroscience, what, at least since Boris Barlow, and perhaps more recently with the work of uh, Olshausen and Field, right? But we're used to thinking about sparse coding in terms of sensory representation. So what I'm suggesting is that we ought to think about sparse coding in terms of data interpretation and data modeling, right? So convolutional sparse coding. I'm not gonna have time to do this slide justice. So the way this journey started for me six or seven years ago is that it turns out that if I make the simple assumption that my neurons are orthogonal, their signatures are orthogonal, it's not a good assumption. But if you make that assumption, you can derive this mathematical result that says that the solution to the convolutional sparse coding problem is exactly projected data onto these signatures, H transpose Y, apply a bias, lambda, and threshold. What is this? This is just a single layer value net, right? So there seems to be a connection between sparse coding and ReLU networks. That's what this slide is supposed to show. When these signatures are not orthogonal to each other, they're not in the model that I showed you, you do something more complicated. The details are not important. You do gradient descent on the L2 loss, you bias, and then you threshold. The point is that the solution to the sparse coding problem is an artificial neural network, surprise, with weights that are specified by the signatures of the neurons and where the nonlinearities depend on the prior that you've imposed. In my case, the fact that I've chosen this type of sparsity prior implies a value. I'll show you towards the end of the talk that different kind of priors imply, com imply completely different structure in that lane space. And that's something we can control. Convolutional dictionary update. To me, this is where deep learning and all this infrastructure that these tech companies have built help us. This step, compared to the sparse coding step, is not parallelizable. Why? Because the signatures are shared across your whole time series. Again, perhaps the signatures are evolving. We can bake this into the model, right? But the parallelization that's offered by processing on GPUs, PyTorch, and so on and so forth, right? To me, this is where they help us. All right? So, Putting it together, what I want to claim is that my problem of learning the signatures and learning and sorting the location event and, the, and their amplitudes, I can turn it formally, you can see the details in our paper, into the problem of turning this, training this autoencoder architecture. So the encoder here takes in data, its goal is to sort, its goal is to, is to take these signatures and output vectors that tell you events locations of events for one neuron and their amplitude. The decoder's goal is to reconstruct that. Pretty reasonable, right? We can prove theorems about this. So I'm talking about sparsity as an inductive bias and so on and so forth. So one of the things that's been frustrating for me in deep learning is that uh, some, no one is yet to show me a generative model for data that when fed to an architecture and then trained by backprop, it recovers the parameters of that model. So we proved this with Bahari. So if you take this architecture that I showed you and you assume that your data are generated from some sparse coding model, right? With some theoretical assumption, we proved that if you train this architecture by backprop, 
it recovers the parameters to within a neighborhood of the true parameters. So think of this as saying that if I train my architecture by backprop, it will provably do sorting, assuming the data are generated close enough to the model, and I will recover signatures for neurons that are close to the true ones. And one, there's one interesting thing that happens in deep learning, and I'll have time to talk about this, uh, ask me offline. It actually turns out that we could do this before deep learning. Before deep learning, we would just backprop to this decoder. What's interesting is that backpropping to the auto encoder actually mathematically accelerates the rate at which you converge to the true parameters. You can talk to Bahari and me about this offline. So just to show you that this works in simulations, so we simulated this example that I showed you before, and what we did is that we have control over the signatures we used to simulate. I initialize the parameters of the network, which is the signatures for the neurons, to something that's roughly 45 degrees from the truth. I train my architecture by backprop, and as a function of epoch, I can, try, I can track the sign of the angle between the filters and the ones that I used to simulate. And this shows you that backprop to these architectures recovers parameters. We could do this as big of scale, but this is just to give you a flavor of what this stuff does. And on this famous Harris data set where we ha actually have labelings of spikes, right, to these intercellular electrodes, right, we can show you that it does sorting, and I'm not going to have time to show this here either, but we can show that we have a similar trade-off to methods out there that are much, much slower than what we can do in terms of the trade-off between false, or false alarms and true positives, right? So that's what I call the linear case in the sense that my decoder over there was linear, right? The more interesting thing, and Bahare, this talk has two parts. After Jonathan's talk, Bahare is going to give you the second part. What's more interesting about this is actually what we can do with this with spikes. So going back to sparsity as a form of inductive bias, what I'm showing you here are data from an experiment in which the whiskers of rat are deflected, anesthetized animals with periodic deflections, and we record from barrel cortex. What I would love to do, I would love to be able to take the spiking activity and map it to some latent representation that has time as a dimension, which gives me a sense of the extent to which whisker velocity or the, the aspects of whisker motion, right, that these neurons are encoding. That's what I would love to be able to do, right? And what we showed, using a similar recipe to what I showed you, right, we're just going to put sparsity here as a form of inductive bias and time, and for this, Expressive generative model, we're going to use something that we're, we all love in neuroscience, some of these GLM type models. And I'm going to show you that you can use, track the same machine I just did to turn it into interpretable architectures to solve these problems. Again, no time to go into the details of the math, but what's happening here is that we have two forms of biases. I know people don't like this word, but I, word, but I think this is important here to think about explicit biases. Interpretable model bias. I want the rate function of my neuron to be signatures for the neuron at different points in time. That's what I want the rate function to be. And I want it to fit the data well. That's this first term. And I want sparsity. I want the latent variables that explain how the stimulus interacts with neural activity to have some sort of an Occam's razor's principle. I want them to be easy to understand. You can crank the exact same machine as I did and turn the problem of learning what I'm calling this implicit stimulus, right? That H, the implicit stimulus, and the stimulus effect X into the problem of training this autoencoder architecture, right? It looks exactly the same as what I showed you in the spark sorting case. The only difference is that now we have a nonlinearity that comes from the fact that my mapping from uh, convolution with the stimulus into rate has to be a nonlinear one because my counts can only be non-negative entries, right? Um, we can prove theorems about this again, right? So this is one of the things that I like about this approach, right? Under which setting can me training my architecture to backdrop recover the correct latent representation? We can prove some results about this, right? So the experiment, again, Bahari's talk will go into this in detail in a different example that I won't go through here. But the experiment here comprises 20 thalamic neurons so whose responses are recorded in response to periodic whisker deflection. So the goal here is, so the black trace you're seeing here, what I'm, which shows you whisker position, right? This is what was programmed into a device, 
as you experimentalists know, right, you take the whisker, you insert it into a piezo electrode, and it deflects it, right? The, the whisker is not showing that ideal whisker motion profile. Can I automatically learn it from data? That's what I'm asking. So a GLM approach would say, you know what, I'm just going to treat this as my stimulus, perhaps extract some features from it, and try to explain neural activity. I'm saying, I want to learn this automatically from, ne from neural data. And I can turn that question into that of training this architecture. So again, in terms of explainability, your GLM just says, take that H over there and put whatever features you want. That's equivalent to my architecture. If you do this in this particular case, if you put whisker velocity in here, right? You learn a latent representation that is also sparse, but that actually does not capture the rich dynamics that are going on in the data. This suggests that whisker motion during the duration of the trial, right, is station the extent to which whisker motion affects neural activity during the duration of the trial is stationary, right, which I would find hard to believe, right? In my approach, initialize your architecture with this, train it by backprop, see what happens. You learn something interesting, you find this. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, right? This is learning the noisy whisker motion profile that actually underlies your data automatically from the spikes. Not only is it learning that, it's also learning the extent to which that noisy whisker motion profile, right, can explain your neural activity. What you have to the right hand side here is a KS plot, which is a measure of goodness of fit. Your GLM sits here in blue, does not do a good well, a good job at uh, fitting the data. And our method does a better job. But again, so Smoothing out all of the details of what I'm talking about here. So my goal is not to convince you to use my method. My goal is to convince you that if we're going to be using deep learning to solving some of these problems, we want to seriously think about what the properties of those latent spaces we want are. In these simple examples, such as spike sorting and analysis of spiking data, I think sparsity and time are those forms of biases that we want to impose on those latent representations. Bahari will talk about this uh, example in 15 minutes. I want to wrap up. Six minutes. Huh? I want to wrap up here and talk about neuroscience and beyond. Right? Again, this is a neuroscience audience, but I think these ideas are important to think about in contexts that are different than neuroscience and in other areas of science. So, in the case of neuroscience, right, we have all this exciting technology, such as NeuroPixels, right, that enables us to record from multiple areas that enables us to get many more neurons that we could say get with tetrodes 10, 20 years ago and so on and so forth, right? So what I wanna convince you of, and I'll do this again in the next slide, is the richness of this sparse coding idea. So if you think of your neural pixel, right? It's a two dimensional array. So now it has spatial variables, right? It records over time. What you're actually recording is a volume. What I'm showing you on the right hand side over there, assume that neighboring your array are three neurons, a black one, a purple one, and a green one, right? And assume that spikes are occurring where on this time axis N you have this black deflection, this purple deflection, and this green deflection. All what that axis represents is a projection of that 3D volume onto the time axis, right? What I'm suggesting is that you have a sparse code here too, as you had in that simple, there's a sparse code that describes this data. What's that sparse code? Is the position of the neurons, right? Which presumably, even if your electrodes drift, it's not drifting too much. The position of the neurons and the times, similar to our spike sorting problem in one dimension, when these events occur. This is a sparse code. It's just a sparse code that's now occurring in space and time, right? And how do we capture a sparse code that's occurring in space and time? We now, instead of having a one-dimensional convolution, we have a three-dimensional convolution with neurons that have three-dimensional signatures now, right? And where events now are described by their location in space and also where they are in time, right? So, but it turns out, again, right, this is just y equals hx plus noise where x is sparse. h is an operator now. So people look at this equation and they think it's a naive and simple and linear model. It's not. As soon as you put sparsity or low dimensional assumptions on this vector in a high dimensional space, it's game over. It's not a linear model anymore. You can talk to me about that offline. Um, this is something we should write up soon at some point, right? And the reason why I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about sparsity and I'm gonna be doing this for a few years to come is that 
it's uncanny to me that this sparse coding models, it occurs almost everywhere in science. Uh, we just talked about neuroscience in acoustics, which is a field that I worked on before, right? So imagine the source separation problem we have in neuroscience, we also have it in speech processing. If we had a bunch of mics here listening to all of us talk, there's a separation problem. And there's complicated physics that describe how uh, sound travels here and bounce across walls and so on and so forth. In astrophysics, we have these huge telescope arrays that are looking at the sky, right? Our sources are astral objects at certain positions in the sky, that we're, whose position we're trying to infer and whose signatures we're also trying to infer. It's a sparse coding problem again. Particle physics has this problem. Optics, genomics has this problem. In text processing, radar, I could, I could go on and on where this idea of sparsity or the search for low dimensional representation in high dimensional spaces occurs. So just branching out here and concluding my talk. So we showed in one paper that uh, this approach that we're proposing is actually very, very highly flexible and modular in the sense that that architecture that I described to you, right? You could use it for different kinds of data models and the only thing that changes are a few blocks that you have to change. I showed you the sparse coding, the spike sorting example, where we sort of had a Gaussian assumption and this block here was just identity. In, my, in, my, in what Bahari will talk about, this is a sigmoid. If you're dealing with Poisson data, something we've done in the context of image denoising from images with very low photon counts, you get different kinds of nonlinearities and so on and so forth. Something that I wish I could have talked about today, but that I can't. Again, I want you to think about sparsity more broadly. So what I showed you is the row, the second row. That's sparsity, or L1, as we're used to thinking about it, right? We've been doing work with group sparsity, sparsity on manifolds, and so on and so forth. And again, it leads to a modular approach where you can control what your latent space looks like by imposing some of these assumptions. I think, I think in the future, what we would want to do is put that sparsity assumption as a scaffolding, as a form of scaffolding, and let a neural network actually learn. I want things to be sparse, but let a neural network learn how complicated that sparse function is. So I'm not suggesting that deep learning is useless and that we shouldn't use it. I'm just saying that we want to be, we, we want to make sure we outsource to it things we don't really understand. In my case, I think sparsity is a natural thing that we want to impose. There's components of those sparse assumptions that we can outsource to the architecture. And this is a quick plug here for, um, so I'm lucky to be part of this new institute we have at Harvard that's headed by Sham Kakade and Bernardo Sabatini. Bernardo Sab Sabatini should not, and Sham both actually, should not be uh, foreign to this uh, community. And it's exactly what it says. It's an institute whose mission is at this intersection of the study of intelligence in artificial systems and biological systems. And I want to make a plug especially. We just finished interviewing our first round of postdoc fellows and we made a few exciting offers. I think one or two people that we made offers to are actually here. And you get three years to think about problems at this intersection with probably not salaries that are as close to industry, but for academics, this is not bad. For academics doing postdocs, I had half this when I was a postdoc. You get access to compute and you get to be part of a, of a vibrant community. And with this, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Demo. Beautiful talk. OK, we have some time for some questions. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Demo. That was a very thought-provoking talk. Um, since, since you brought up this idea, I'm a, I'm a physicist by training, so I'm very amenable to the idea that our model should be interpretable. Um, and in physics, right, obviously the, the main constraint that underlies all physical models are essentially what sounds almost like tautological statements about the world. You know, physics should look the same if I'm here, or if I'm here, or if I face this way or that way. Um, since sparsity is sort of at the heart of what you propose, I was wondering if you could say a few more words about where you think the origin of that constraint is and what that means. Obviously, in Barlow's work, it was about minimizing you know, redundancy. You know, in Olshausen, you see it referred to uh, as an energetic constraint. Um, how do you think about why sparsity is underlying these models? That's, that's, that's a... That's a... Yeah, I'll use the mic. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about this offline. So I'm becoming convinced that it's low dimensional manifold structure. So think of high dimensional data, but that's sitting on a low dimensional manifold, right? 
what, what, what these architectures to me are really doing, right, with especially value nets, we're just chopping up those low dimensional manifolds into triangles. So, and the sparsity to me comes from those triangles. So, any, so you have a low dimensional manifold in high dimensional space. It might be nonlinear, but locally it looks linear, right? If the manifold is smooth enough and you have enough pieces to chop it up with. So if you give me any point in the domain, the, ma the local manifold it belongs to is a sparse description. Thank you. Hi, Demba. I wondered if you might entertain another philosophical question. I love those. So, uh, uh, I wondered if you could tease apart a bit more your thinking about physical versus biological systems, uh, because it seems to me that in biological systems, for information from Y to be actionable by that biological system, it has to be learnable and representable in a small, finite system with noise. So do you think that the sparsity constraint is different between biological and artificial systems in a way that reveals something about the, the functional constraints of the biology in a, in a sort of meaningful way? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a tough, that's a tough uh, philosophical question. Do, do, I, do, I think, do I think they're different? I think they have to be to a certain extent. I think they, they have to be in a certain extent because of some of these functional constraints that you've just mentioned, right? I can point you to some work So I, I mentioned gene genomics as one of the fields that's picking up on these sparse coding ideas, right? So imagine you're imagine as you're at roughly about twenty thousand genes, ima genes. Imagine them being organized in these functional clusters, basically, that a cell gets to pick which of these functional clusters it wants to express, and it expresses uh, gene expression based on some of those signatures. So in a sense. I think the difference is one of the scale at which you're trying to describe the system. I think if I care about the low level biology, I wouldn't buy myself this sparse coding idea. But if I think about this as a systems level in the biological context, I think it makes sense. For physical systems, the reason why I think it makes sense is this idea of space and time again, right? I mean, our dynamics occur in space and time and that's what we're really trying to capture. But I, I would love to talk to you more about this offline. That'd be great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, one more question, please. Heather, um, thanks for the talk. Um, on the ladybird on a leaf slide, you mentioned- Could you, could you speak a bit louder, please? Oh, sorry, um, on the slide that had the ladybird on the leaf, you mentioned um, the cost of labeled data, like, you know, uh, translation and also like, you know, saying ladybird on a leaf. Um, I was wondering where is that uh, cost derived from? Like, how, how was that calculated? So. It's calculated from people that actually, so friends of mine and in, in industry who actually pay money to get labeled data. And this is also data that I obtained from some colleagues at Harvard that work in linguistics, basically. How much do they charge to actually get you a labeled pair translated from one language to another? So in that simple example, the $1 is actually a huge un under underestimate. It's about let's say about $10, but still, it's still an order of magnitude lower, or two orders of magnitude lower than the costs of obtaining those same labeled example in these in this scientific or engineering examples that I mentioned. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's okay, nice. Thank you very much, Gemma. Here we go. Very nice. Our, our first contributed talk of the session is from Aditi Jha. Um, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Aditi, and I'm going to be talking about my work on inverse reinforcement learning for modeling animal behavior. So understanding decision making is an important problem in systems neuroscience. And one typical approach to do this is to train animals in binary decision making tasks, such as those shown here. Now, these models these, these tasks, along with the models that have been developed to study them, have provided us with a lot of insights about decision making. But these tasks remain limited in their ability to generalize to real world settings. In these settings, animals have to choose between left and right on every trial, and they get immediately rewarded at every correct trial. Now let's contrast this with a different setting. Imagine a graduate student at a cosine poster session. They may explore posters in the beginning, hit the bar at some point, 
and get back home once they are tired. In all of this, they are making decisions sequentially, choosing between multiple options without an immediate reward. So the behavior here is driven mainly by intrinsic motivations or intrinsic rewards. And these intrinsic rewards can be varying over time. The motivation to see posters, for example, suffers once you come to hear of a party or once you're tired. And so while this is one specific example, such time varying intrinsically motivated behavior underlies several naturalistic settings. This exact behavior was studied by Rosenberg et al. in the Meister lab at Caltech, where they let mice navigate in the maze environment, where mice made sequential decisions, and only one point in this maze provided them with water. Now, in this new complex experimental setup, there are limited computational models which can allow us to understand and uncover these time-varying intrinsic rewards, and that is the gap that we wish to fill through this work. So I'm going to start by giving you a brief description of this data set because it is our motivation for this work. Um, so mice were put in this home cage here, which is directly connected to the maze. This maze has 127 nodes in it, where node zero is directly connected to the home cage. And the rest of the maze is structured like a binary tree, as I'm showing here. So at any point in the maze, the animal can either go deeper into the maze by turning to the left or the right, or it can move, come backwards by turning back and there are also 32, 64 terminal nodes actually in this maze. Uh, Rosenberg et al. studied the behavior of mice in this maze over hours um, in the dark, and they recorded their trajectories as mice navigated through this environment. They looked at two different cohorts of 10 mice each. The first cohort was water restricted, and so the mazes of these water restricted mice had a water port highlighted in gray here, uh, which provided them with water. So these mice were incentivized to locate this water port. The other 10 uh, mice were not water restricted and their mazes did not have a water port. So our goal in this setting is to come up with a model of their time varying behavior. And specifically the question that we are interested in is, what are the intrinsic rewards motivating navigation behavior here? This can subsequently help us answer other scientific questions such as how do animals explore? And, and to uh, motivate this idea of intrinsic rewards a little bit more in this setting, let's think about the water unrestricted mice. There is clearly no extrinsic reward in this environment for them. However, they still extensively explore the maze. Even the water restricted mice, who have a clear extrinsic water reward here, despite finding this water port, spend a lot of time exploring other parts of the maze. So clearly there are intrinsic rewards motivating behavior here which are unknown to us. So how do we solve this problem? How do we understand what these intrinsic rewards are? Fortunately for us, there is a set of methods called inverse reinforcement learning, which does exactly this. So inverse RL uses information about the environment, such as the states in the environment, or in this setting, the nodes in the maze, the possible actions in the environment, which here would be turning to the left, right, backwards, or just staying at the same point, as well as the transition structure of the environment, along with the animal's trajectories. So here, each zeta is a set of state action pairs drawing out a trajectory starting from the home and back to the home. So using information about the environment and these observed trajectories, inverse reinforcement learning methods aim to infer the reward function of the agent. So the high-level idea here is that these must be the rewards that the states in the maze must be offering to the animal for it to execute these trajectories. And once we have these rewards, we can also learn the policy of the animal, which tells us what is the most probable action that the animal will take at any state, allowing us to predict its decisions. So, so far, so good. We want to learn what these intrinsic rewards are. We can use inverse reinforcement learning to do this. However, inverse RL has been developed in the machine learning literature for specific applications. And so all of these existing inverse RL methods assume a static reward function. So let's understand what that means. If we were to use a typical IRL or inverse RL method to uh, get back the reward of this water port here, it would give us a reward which is constant over time or constant through the course of the animal's trajectory. While realistically, the reward function should be higher when the animal is thirsty, but once it's satiated, we expect the reward for the same port to go down. So we want a more flexible method which allows us to model these dynamic time-bearing rewards and so we came up with our own approach called Dynamic Inverse Reinforcement Learning, or DIRL. So Dynamic Inverse RL also uses information about the environment and the trajectories, 
but now to infer time varying rewards so along with being a function of the state that the, uh, that the animal is in these rewards are also going to be function of the time during the trajectory and so now these rewards can also give us a time varying policy which should ideally help us predict the decisions of these animals better so next i'll move on to explaining the method in a little more detail so here is a generative model or our assumed model of animals underlying behavior um as i said earlier we want rewards to be functions of time and to be able to change across time for every state we parameterize the reward for every state at time t as a linear combination of a small number of what we call goal maps uh now what is a goal map so a goal map is a static reward function let's imagine a 3 cross 3 grid environment here forget about the big maze for a moment um there could be one node here which is providing water again just a, just a toy example so here we could think of having a water reward map which is only rewarding at the water node and not rewarding elsewhere in the maze and this is capturing the thirst objective of of the animal so we could have multiple goal maps each capturing a different objective for example there could be a home goal map only rewarding at the home port and not rewarding elsewhere and so on along with these goal maps we also have a set of time varying weights which tell us what is the contribution of of this goal map to the final reward function so for example the weights corresponding to the first goal map are smaller in the beginning but then go up over time and so the final reward of every state at time t is going to be the sum of its rewards coming from each of these goal maps weighted by these time varying rewards and this is what allows them to be dynamic in time varying so now with this underlying reward structure to model the animal's navigation behavior we assume that they execute a softmax policy seeking to optimize the the expected sum of future rewards at every state given this reward structure so this is our assumed model underlying behavior and now we want to do inference which is that we want to fit these observed trajectories to our model and infer these goal maps these time varying weights as well as how many of these exist underlying animal behavior and then of course these goal maps and weights can be combined together to get back the intrinsic rewards i will not talk in detail about how we do inference in this setting just because of time restrictions but broadly we use a bayesian approach to maximize the probability of these observed trajectories under our model now moving on to the results we applied our method to both cohorts of mice in in the rosenberg et al paper uh, we clustered trajectories of both water restricted and unrestricted mice separately and here's what we get So for the water restricted cohort our method um, reveals two goal maps as being the optimal solution the first goal map here looks like a water goal map as it is highly rewarding at the water port and unrewarding elsewhere the second one looks like a home goal map as it is highly rewarding at the home node and unrewarding elsewhere corresponding to these goal maps we also find that the time varying weights for these water for this water goal map are higher in the beginning and that of the home goal map are higher later on So typically the animal enters the maze as it's thirsty with uh, as a result of which the the rewards corresponding to the water goal map are higher in the beginning and as it gets fatigued the home goal maps weights increase we can combine them to get the water rewards which mirror the same thing uh finally we also held out a set of these animals trajectories and tried to see that the policy if if the policy learned by by these rewards uh, is able to explain those held out trajectories and we compare this to existing inverse reinforcement learning methods which learn a static reward function so here i'm plotting test log, log likelihood which is uh, where higher is better so we find that our approach with two goal maps is best able to explain the set of held out trajectories quantitatively In the setting of water restricted mice it is sort of expected that we would get a water goal map and a home goal map because these animals are thirsty and so the water port is rewarding for them but it's very unclear as to what should we be expecting in the setting of water unrestricted mice and here again we get one map that looks like the home goal map being highly rewarding at the home port but we also get another one which we call the explore goal map as it seems to be rewarding at many points in the maze except for the home state and the weights corresponding to the explore map are higher in the beginning while that corresponding to the home map go over uh, go higher later on in time so the animal is incentivized to explore as it enters the maze uh the overall reward functions again depict the same thing and finally we also held out a set of trajectories in this case and saw that our method with two goal maps was best able to explain those trajectories compared to other existing methods So to summarize here I told you about a novel inverse reinforcement framework uh, that that we came up with which is able to infer time varying intrinsic rewards 
Our method returned interpretable rewards for the two cohorts of mice uh, in the Rosenberg et al. task, but we hope that it, it's going to be widely useful to understand intrinsic rewards in several naturalistic settings. Here is a QR code uh, with details about the method and more results. Uh, it is a link to our Europe's paper. And finally, I want to thank Zoe Ashford, who led this project along with me, my advisor, Jonathan Pillow, and the rest of the Pillow Lab. And thanks to all of you for listening. Happy to take any questions. All right, do we have some questions for Aditi? So uh, I do have a question. Yeah. So do you see any indication that parts of the, the maze that it hasn't yet explored are more rewarding? Um, I would, so I haven't explicitly looked at, looked at like comparing the number of, the frequency of, of visitation counts to, to the rewards, but I would guess not because the method uses the observed trajectory. So if there are parts of the maze that the mouse doesn't explore at all, I wouldn't expect uh, uh, my method to give back uh, those notes as being rewarding. So then how do you think about it as an exploration? Like, is there some way of characterizing exploration with the uncertainty of things you haven't seen? Yeah, so I think in this setting, the maze is small enough that these mice extensively explore parts of the maze, so I'm not worried about not being able to capture exploration particularly here. But I assume that you could put in biases or add in smoothness, et cetera, constraints, and be able to explain uncertain exploration as well. But, but that's not what we've looked at so far. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, I think, uh, I, I Ethan, think you, you were first. first. Uh, okay, whichever way. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much. I, I think it's really can cool. You, can you speak up? Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's really cool your approach for inferring the whole map of intrinsic reward. Uh, my question is, in the water-restricted case, I would have expected to see just like a highlight right around the water zone, you know, for where they're getting the reward. But it looks like there was quite a lot of sort of reward coming from almost everywhere else in the maze, like about 0.3 or 0.5. Uh, I was wondering where is that coming from, and could it be like another form of, in a way, exploration highlighting the maze? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned earlier also, these animals, despite finding where the water port is, they do make some direct routes to the water port, but they still extensively explore other parts of the maze. And that is basically what's giving back those, high, those other notes as being rewarding as well. Because these animals, while they are incentivized to find the water port, they're also incentivized to explore other parts of the environment. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. John. First of all, very nice work. Thank you. Um, we covered it in the journal club, so it's good. Uh, so my question is, I think this is a very nice approach to imagine the reward function as time varying and then try to figure out what's going on. But an alternative way to look at the problem is to assume a static reward function and to augment the state space with some internal state like thirst or something else. Do you think using your method you can kind of infer what relevant internal states like thirst might be? Yeah, so I think uh, it's sort of what we are doing, right? I guess what you're saying is that what if we had internal discrete states as opposed to continuous rewards, for example. So I feel like the, the approach that you're suggesting is a specific case of our model, where instead of letting the rewards vary continuously, if we said that it has to be in one of k states at a time, that's that's basically what would give a thirst state, for example, and a fatigue state, for example. So yeah, I think I think it should be we should be able to infer those kind of informations from from this model. One more question while um, we're getting set up. The next speaker, I think there was a question over there, or is that no? Okay, well then, thanks once again. Just want to do that. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Bahara Tulashams. Yes. How did I do? Bahara Tulashams. Nice. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I would like to uh, first thank uh, the co-sign for um, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk here. Uh, with you about our work. So as uh, Dembo mentioned, I'm a, a PhD student uh, graduating this year in electrical engineering from Harvard University. Uh, this is a collaborative work that done at Harvard with amazing researchers uh, and collaborators. 
uh, Deborah, my advisor um, from Murthy Lab, and also Uchida Lab at Harvard University. So as Demba explained, uh, in the classical regime of uh, neuroscience experiment, uh, we are in the area that uh, the experiments that we perform has certain structures. So for example, we collect some data such that the event of interest that we want to characterize, it's um, time aligned so that in order to perform the analysis, we can go and construct a PSCH of uh, averaging across the trials and smoothing and apply dimensionality reduction, such as PCA and TCA, to analyze data. As we move forward, uh, going toward naturalistic experiments, the analysis of data is not that easy. The trials having unstructured um, 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 uh, structure, uh, the events of interest are overlapping, perhaps, as the animals are freely moving and experiencing different settings. And with the advancement of the technology, we have a large amount of data to analyze. And with the advancement of deep learning, we've been, um, majority of us, moving into uh, analysis, analysis of the neural data characterizations using various deep neural architectures. Uh, here I'm bringing uh, two examples of LFADs uh, for uh, analysis of a single trial. Um, uh, of experiments, and another one that earlier we um, saw in the cosine of Sebra, they're trying to use self-supervised approaches, learning and embedding with disentangled representations. Having these two in uh, both sides of the spectrum, uh, what Demba and I have been trying to push forward is uh, if we can uh, connect the two approaches and to take the best of the both worlds. So uh, this is a framework that particularly uh, for the sparse coding setting, I'm referring to it as a deconvolution or unrolled neural learning. It's a framework that tries to tackle the drawbacks of each of these uh, the spectrums. Uh, as an example, highlighting two settings here, the classical methods are not applicable for inferring uh, 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 information from single trial data or uh, the interpretability of the deep learning frameworks as a black box method is under question, uh, which we're trying to tackle here. Uh, Demba is slightly talking about the generalization aspects. So for certain experiments, we may not have uh, a huge amount of data, and the question is whether deep learning will um, uh, generalize in those regimes, and this is a setting that we are trying to have uh, capability of not overfitting in the neuroscience experiment. And the speed, again, at the amount of uh, examples uh, get larger and larger. We like to be able to have deep learning techniques to analyze data. So having those, the approach uh, uh, that we talked about in terms of interpretability, how useful would be for computational neuroscience? So interpretability is known outside of computational neuroscience as explainable AI, and it's trying to tackle the problem of uh, how we can make sense of the predictions that a deep neural network make. To set this stage as an example, you look into an input image and trying to construct, for example, saliency map to tell you which part of the image uh, you have looked into to tell me that there is a Labrador in the, in the uh, example that you analyze. So however, this type of interpretability is not always going to work. Uh, it may, uh, the network learn representations that are not desired or useful. For example, uh, one problem, uh, there, in computer vision, uh, you may say there is a husky uh, in the image, um, and I classify it as a wolf, and it looked only into a representations of the data, which is the uh, snow in the background. So we want to tackle this challenge of interpretability to learn representations that are desired and understandable. And this problem even become harder in the unsupervised regime, which is the case for majority of the neuroscience experiments. So hence, the generic interpretability does not apply here. And one last thing is what we want from interpretability is to be able to answer certain scientific questions from the data we analyze. In our setting, the interpretability that we introduce for computational neuroscience trying to uh, tackle uh, these drawbacks that I explained. The framework that Demba earlier explained goes into the uh, larger uh, category of uh, literature and uh, known as unrolling. So this started with a seminal work in 2010 with, uh, at New York University, and there's a review paper known in the signal processing literature as algorithm unrolling. It has been used in many different settings, perhaps by the end of this talk, 
uh, we can include the computational neuroscience into the list. So if you don't like sparsity, uh, which I'm obsessed with, uh, here uh, we can argue for an interpretability uh, 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 as a framework that we want to move away from the end-to-end -end deep learning into a regime that we focus on representations that we learn. So particularly with Demba and I, we focus on the properties of the representations to be a sparse representation than in time so that we can relate it to the uh, single trial experiments that we have in the neuroscience. This is particularly important for us to be able to deconvolve uh, multiple signals of the neural data. By the deconvolution, so we're going to assume a model on the firing rates. So we have firing rates of the neurons at the single trial level. Here, there are four trials that I'm showing. Ideally speaking, we want to deconvolve it into uh, the number of events that we want to characterize. So let's say there are three events. Uh, we want to decompose it into three events. In this particular setting, you may say there are two events that are overlapping. The blue one uh, has a uh, neural strength that is a constant across trial and another one that varies as we move from one trial to another. The representations of interest that we will infer is a rep sparse representation and in time that encode the timing of the events that are happening and the neural strength. And at the same time, we learn a dictionary that the kernels uh, that are localized to characterize the neural activity. Having this, we can set up an optimization problem as Demba explained, and using that to construct a structured deep neural network uh, to infer single trial sparse representation from data and uh, characterize our experiment. So there are several design choices that the framework is flexible to have. So uh, depending on the timing of the events being known or unknown, having the uh, estimate of the kernel shapes, uh, how many number of events that you have uh, as you want to use it for your experiment, those can be set in a flexible fashion. And with the framework, so now I like to um, change gears and talk about an uh, experiment in characterizing uh, dopamine neurons, uh, which um, uh, basic dopamine neurons uh, have a certain uh, reward prediction error signaling that consists of two components. They're known as salience and value in the literature, and they're overlapping. And uh, the important problem is for us to be able to deconvolve these multiple signals from one another. So this can help us to understand how the neurons participate in coding the reward prediction error and what are the uh, uh, function diversity of the neurons uh, as a population. So to um, uh, understand the properties of those uh, components, the salience appears um, at the very beginning of the neural response to the reward that is invariant to the amount of reward that has been given to the animal, followed by another component and that is referred to the, in the literature by value that contains information of the reward amount uh, as an example here. So given this deconvolutional problem, we can, we can apply the framework that I earlier explained. Uh, uh, we applied it for uh, the um, and neuroscience experiment of dopaminergic neurons that had been previously collected in Uchida lab and published. It's a scenario that uh, is a classical conditioning task. There are two types of trials where in the first trials of a surprise, the animals will get some reward. The amount of the reward is not, not known to the animal. And in the other type of trials, the animal will have an order queue such that after 1.5 seconds, the reward will uh, appear. Collecting spiking data by looking into the empirical firing rates, uh, visually we see those two components that we are interested in decom uh, deconvolving from one another. As a design choice, uh, given the structure of the data that we have, we assume the timing of the events are known. Uh, we do not have information about the reward amount, neither the kernel shapes. Applying the framework, uh, we can learn localized kernel to characterize the order and two kernels to characterize the reward response. With what we know in the literature, the framework is able to learn kernels that resemble the salience and value in shape. Moving forward, we can now look into the sparse representations that we learn within the deep layers of the neural network as a visualizations here, as we go from this single trial of low reward amount to high reward amount, the uh, representations that we are encoding, for example, as a value increase as we move forward. So this can help us 
to, uh, to infer interpretable information, for example, capturing the trial types by uh, looking into the code of the salient and capturing of the reward amount by looking into the code of the value. With that, uh, 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 we were able to look into the population of neurons, to look into uh, verifying the diversity of the response of the neurons that is known also as a distributional code in the literature, and uh, the representations as a function of reward amount verify that the value component encodes reward prediction error. So further down, the problem was the deconvolution of these two components. Uh, comparing to the classical techniques of deconvolving these two components, we can now use the, inf the representations that we infer uh, and show that it's more informative of the reward prediction error comparing to windowing methods that are being used in the literature. Moving forward, as Demba explained, we, uh, we can apply this to other data modalities. In this setting, we also apply this to uh, calcium signals. The only thing that needs to be changed is a link function. The results and conclusions are the same. And uh, for experimentalists, we also have characterizations of the model of under what conditions the things that you learn you can trust as a function of whether the events that you have, the timing are known, uh, how much the neurons are responsive as a background firing rate, and this spike can be in size in terms of analysis. The data, for example, that I show in this regime, the darker these characterizations are, the better are the model, model recovery. To conclude, uh, we move from representations to optimization models that we construct and then design a neural network. So if you don't like the sparsity to be the properties of the representation that you have, uh, which uh, I worked pretty much for majority of my uh, a PhD work. Uh, in this review paper, there has been many different approaches and uh, models that can be used. As an example, uh, this is from the world literature of communication that are using Kalman Net as a neural network to capture dynamics. Uh, and I want to uh, thank all the collaborators and open to discussion. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for a few questions before we break. So I have, I have one. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the relationship between temporal sparsity and predictability? So you talked about reward prediction error. This is a place where you might have an expectation, and then the way you get sparsity is by subtracting the prediction. Is that generic, or is that specific to that case? Uh, so the sparsity that we have, it was temporal in time. So the prediction of the reward that we had was a function of the, the energy of these sparse codes that we have. So we were not doing the classical predictions as a neural network to perform a prediction. So we were looking into how much of the new, uh, uh, how much is the uh, strength of the neural response into the interpretable sparse representations uh, as a, um, uh, as an argue that is encoding reward prediction error. Thank you. We do have a question over here. Thank you for the talk. I was curious about the unrolled deep neural net algorithm. Did you have to train it on? Can you get closer to the mic? <clears throat> Excuse me. I was curious about the unrolled deep neural net algorithm. Did you have to train it on multiple spike sorting tasks simultaneously to train the weights of that algorithm so they can be applied across the board? Or did you retrain that algorithm per task? So uh, we train the algorithm on uh, one uh, experiment setup, so which means there is one task. So the collective uh, kernel characterizations that we have are collectively across all the trials. So however, at the time of the inference, we infer information at a single trial, uh, and depending on the design from single neurons as well. OK, let's thank our speaker once more. And finally, let's thank all the speakers in the session, uh, and then we'll break for lunch.